Patterson and Michael Remus. Hey, what's up, everybody? Oh, Masters Week continues. Jets practice today. Lots to get to on today's edition of Winnipeg Sports Talk Daily. Uh, great to have you with us. I've shown it to everybody in chat. Thanks to everyone listening on the podcast. Uh, don't forget, if you ever have the opportunity, you podcast listeners, to uh, give us a five-star rating and a little review at Apple Podcasts or Spotify. It always helps out. And uh, for anyone that hasn't yet voted for your boys' Winnipeg Sports Talk at the Winnipeg Nightlife Awards, um, do us a favor. Throw us a bone, wnla.ca. And um, there's a bunch of great local businesses in there, but uh, we're vote nominated for top radio station slash podcast. Would love to win the award. So yeah, WNLA.ca. Very simple to get uh, out and do that. All right, uh, we've got a bu busy show today. Scott Wheeler of The Athletic is going to join us, and we will be discussing the Jets prospect pool. Scott had an extended piece a little earlier, and we've been planning on getting him on for a while. And now it's sort of looking like it's just about next year time for the Winnipeg Jets figured it would be nice to get Scott's take on uh, some of the next generation of Winnipeg Jet players, what they've done so far this season and how they might project into potentially next year's lineup or in the years to come. Um, Jeff Hamilton's going to join us a little bit later on as well, midway through the program for the latest on the Winnipeg Jets heading into these final 12 games of the season. Might even talk a little off-season CFL with Hammer, as well as, you know, 70 games in, how the Winnipeg Jets find themselves in this predicament and what is at stake right now and what can be gained from these final dozen games before a very interesting off-season. And then... It is Masters Week. We continue with our Masters guests and really looking forward to having Matt Wiley. He is the host of the very popular golf podcast, Golflandia. Talked to Wiley a few times in the old days. Going to get him on for the first time on Winnipeg Sports Talk today. And, um, you know, we'll get Michael Remus in here. We've got some great news on our pools as it pertains to the Masters. So we'll let you know about that in just a second. Now, before I do that, a big thank you to the sponsors that make this program happen each and every day. Whether you're with us on YouTube, whether you're listening on the podcast, it doesn't happen without a group, including our newest sponsor, Wallace & Wallace, our great friends over at Breezy Bend Country Club, F Apparel, Vita Health, Culligan Water, Manitoba Battery, Royal Sports, Not Auto Corp, Little Brown Jug, Breezy Bend, the Nick and Nicky DQ Group, of course, Princess Auto, Canadian Club Whiskey, and our betting partners at Cool Bet Canada. By the way, speaking of Cool Bet, uh, the Green Jackets came on today for the Tuesday edition of the Lock Shop. Dustin Nielsen and I just finished up the Lock Shop. You can grab it wherever you get your favorite podcasts or just check on uh, my Twitter feed or Dusty's Twitter feed for the full, full video feed of our outrights. And tomorrow morning, 11 a.m. Central, I'll be jumping on with uh, Pat and JBM from the Cool Bet team, and we'll kind of get into some more exotic bets for the event, top fives, top tens, top 20s, and more in addition to the outrights. But uh, lots of time to get those wagers in before the uh, Masters starts, as well as to enter our Masters DraftKings pool. And Michael Remus, as he joins us right now, Remo, I cannot remember you being in as good of a mood and as excited when you dropped the breaking news in the text chat this morning that DraftKings had finally figured it out and expanded the opportunity to have resize contests beyond 20 players. This is groundbreaking news for us at Winnipeg Sports Talk considering the size of the contest we used to run and we haven't been able to because of people not getting notifications or the damn thing not running if we picked a contest that was too big. Yeah, this is um, for anyone who's been playing DraftKings with us. 
If you, I put out a 50 person contest for the masters and it's all, almost full. It's at 43 people. So I'll have to do another one. But yeah, I mean, we can do contests now and they'll automatically resize. So we can do much bigger ones. If people like playing fantasy on DraftKings, sorry, people in Ontario, you're no longer cool. able to, but, um, let us know and we can send you an invite or if you never played and you want to get signed up, we can send you uh, a link to get you some a bonus as well. So, um, yeah, exciting times. Uh, I know the Masters. I don't know if you play fantasy golf, but, you know, I'm kind of, and I really wasn't that excited, but Tiger Woods saying today he's coming in. This weekend's nuts. I mean, Stone Cold Steve Austin at WrestleMania followed up by Tiger Woods <laughs> at the Masters. <laughs> Legends week. This is crazy. <laughs> Uh, I, so I'm I'm way more excited for the Masters than I may have been uh, before. Yeah. So uh, listen, if you're in the Winnipeg Sports Talk group on DraftKings, check your notifications. You should have an invite there. Uh, we actually they did work. I got mine. I got in, and I will officially announce with this new development my return to the DraftKings hockey contest that I had been absent from for the last month or two. Uh, a number of things that went into that. But, I mean, I really do like getting a bunch of people in, 30 or 40 or 50 mm -hmm. people. I mean, it's a lot more fun when you had a big, big group, and the rewards are bigger when you have a great team. Um, but if you've been in any of our pools beforehand, the Masters, the golf ones, for my money, are the best. I mean, the most fun, put in your three bucks, and, you know, you've got Thursday and Friday, you sweat out, hopefully having your guys make the cut, and then it gets really fun on the weekend. So, uh DraftKings.com, and uh, if you if you haven't played there before, get in there, get an account, let us know what you are. We'll make sure we invite you to our DraftKings group. And yes, Remus, as you mentioned, the big news today, Tiger Woods getting to the podium, and Eldrick is going to tee it up on Thursday. Yeah, as I said, very uh, exciting. We weren't sure if this was even possible following his car accident where you know he's in a hospital, uh, couldn't really walk, and he's says that he's ready to go. He thinks he can even win, which um, is a shocker. So I'm not sure what his odds are at Cool Bet, but um, I saw pictures of him practicing. We're talking about practice, and it was packed there. And I know he's older. Oh, the crowds for his practice round yesterday yeah. were, it looked like Sunday afternoon yes. at the Masters in the final round. It was crazy. Yes. So uh, pretty... Here's Pretty a little insane. update. It's, I'm glad you brought that up because Woods was originally listed at 60 to one, I think, which mm -hmm. still seemed like really uh, low for a guy in his situation. Then there were some rumblings that he might actually play and they thought that he was going to play and it went to 50. Well, it's now 45 to one. Um, but what is interesting, they've got a wait, they've got a bet out there to make the cut and it opened at even money. It's now minus 105. Wow. And my prediction, Dusty was just asking me this on the lock shop, and I said, you know what, dude? I have a feeling that by the time Tiger Woods tees off, this is either a pick em or it's slightly more expensive to bet him to make the cut than to miss the cut, which is the opposite right now. Because and we talk a lot about public teams, and the Leafs have a ton of fans, so everyone's betting them. You get a bit better number. There is simply no better public bet in maybe the history of sports betting than Tiger Woods, whether it's to win and certainly for something like this to make the cut. So I will have a little skin in the game on Tiger to make the cut. No, I don't think he's going to win the tournament, but I'll tell you what, it sure would be nice to see that red shirt prancing around on Sunday. Uh, maybe in contention, maybe not. Uh, but I think we all know that the Masters tournament with Tiger Woods is uh, certainly a hell of a lot better than without. Yeah, of course. Uh, I think it brings in, it's like, again, it's like Stone Cold coming to WrestleMania, Tiger Woods <laughs> at the Masters. Um, you know, you associate him, you know, winning the, what, the green jacket in 1997. He had the most recent win uh, when it seemed like, you know, he wasn't capable of winning majors anymore. And uh, it was only a couple of years ago Then he had the car accident. We weren't sure if he would, you know, be playing again. And here he is. Very, I think it's, it's great, exciting. And I'm, my ears perked up. When I saw the tweets that said he was in. Um, hey, uh, quickly, I just got a DM from uh, from Wiley. Did you send him the link? I think I emailed it to him, yeah. Uh, I can DM it to him if he didn't get it. Excellent. Okay, so sounds good. Yeah, fire him a DM as well. Uh, yeah, we will email right. and 
DM it to you. Sorry, folks, you're kind of hearing this live on the go, but we don't want to make sure that our guests are going to be here. So we'll get to all of that coming up. uh, We will talk more Masters second hour of the program after we're finished with the hockey. Uh, Looking forward to having Scott Wheeler come on right away. And uh, we will have Jeff Hamilton as well. It's a quick update from Jets practice from Mike McIntyre. Mm. Um, No Jansen Harkins. Uh, He is in concussion protocol after taking an elbow from Arthur Kaliev on Saturday. Um, He's apparently day-to-day, but will not play Wednesday versus Detroit. Potentially could play uh, versus the Colorado Avalanche. Um, And... Listen, I mean, this is obviously unfortunate. You never want to hear any players injured, especially when it comes to concussion protocol, something that can really have long-lasting effects. Uh, But I'll say this. uh, I have been left wanting more of Morgan Barron in the first couple games that he's played. I mean, the the fourth line in both the Toronto game and the game against the Los Angeles Kings had very, very limited minutes. Um, So I'll tell you what, I think this will be an increased responsibility for Morgan Barron. I think they'll be playing a team that will probably be easier for Dave Lowry to get Morgan Barron and the fourth line out against. Sure would be nice to play with the lead for a while. Um, And, you know, when we're talking about the final 12 games of the season, I mean, players like Morgan Barron, how they potentially fit into next year's lineups, what they can do and showing both the organization and the fans what they bring to the table, I think is one of the things we have to look forward to. So, uh, listen, it sucks that it comes at the expense of Jansen Harkins but certainly looking forward to seeing them Morgan Barron. And to be honest, I would, like I said, I think we know what Adam Brooks is. He was a guy that came in off waivers, um, you know, a depth piece if there ever was one. Um, maybe this is the time to get David Gustafson back up and give him a little bit of time in the lineup. I'm really not too sure how that goes, um, but the uh, Moose have a little bit of time here. Ice coming back, we'll get to all of that right now. But as far as the Winnipeg Jets go, no Jansen Harkins. And that was the... Uh, that was the one bit of news today out of practice before the Jets uh, get ready for the big bobblehead night tomorrow with Connor Hellebuck and the fishing rod and the uh, lone season visit of the Red Wings ream. Yeah, the other note, we have people here every day asking, where's Perfetti? What's Cole Perfetti up to? We haven't heard him. Dave Lowry saying today, not skating, remains unavailable. And you and I were chatting just before the start of the show yesterday. Uh, I know people want to ask the updates, but like, I'm not expecting him back maybe for the end of till the end of the season or after. Um, just seems seems they said it was long term, not skating. There's only like 11 games left. Um, I don't, I'm not too optimistic when it comes to Cole Perfetti. Um, the other note was with the defense pairs. I know they're all rotating in and out. It seems like yesterday Hainala was. Well, on the third pair, but now it's we have Morrissey, Demello, Schmidt, Pionk, Stanley, Dillon, and thank you, Ken Weeb, for reporting those. And Hainala was was uh, the extra one rotating in, so we'll kind of have to wait and see tomorrow. I don't know what they're gonna do with Hainala and Stanley, but it seems like uh, Logan Stanley. You guys mentioned it yesterday. What his injuries? He seems to be fine in terms of being able to play in the lineup, and that was, he, he appears to be the guy. I did not believe that for a second, and I don't think many people did. I mean, I have no problem with a coach, you know, of a guy that's had a couple rough games, you know, float a little BS out there, to, you know, to protect yeah, yeah. the player. I mean, the guy's a young defenseman. Like, I mean, I know there's a lot of people out there that for whatever reason think that if you like Billy Hanela, you have to hate Logan Stanley and vice versa, which is ridiculous. Um, but... You know, for young players and certainly the way this organization has gone about, they do it for veterans. Why the hell wouldn't they do it for a first or second year player? Guys, a couple rough games. You know, maybe you don't go into the media and say, well, frankly, he's stunk the last two games and he's out of the lineup. That's why. I mean, we'd all appreciate that sort of frankness, but there's a price to be paid for that as well. Um, That wasn't going to be the case. Billy Hanel has come in. Um, But regardless, I mean, what I, I what I'm very interested in, when you sort of touched on this. And maybe they go with the five veterans and one of the young players in this game on Wednesday, because I know they're not technically mathematically eliminated. Uh, but I really think that it is important for them to get both Stanley and Vili Hanela in these games. I'd like to see Vili play at least 10 of the final 12, unless he's get goes back to the Manitoba Moose, uh, maybe for a, the final few games of the season and then play in the playoffs as well. Um, but I mean, I don't see a lot to be gained, especially if some of the veteran defensemen, like we suspect Neil Pionk has been, uh, have been playing through injuries and playing some through some things that kept them out of morning skates and some practices. 
I mean, once you realize that you've hit the end of the road and you're playing for next year, um, I think the decision-making and the lineup should reflect that. And, I mean, the best thing that the Winnipeg Jets can have going to next season is some of these young players that need playing time, that need experience, can get it right now. And, yeah, no, they didn't want to be in this situation where they had the opportunity afforded to them to do that, but that's where we are right now. So, um, listen, I think press box time for either of those guys does nothing positive for either of them going forward. And uh, I am not a either-or guy. I think both of those guys have bright futures for the Winnipeg Jets in the years to come. No, you got to say which one you want in the lineup. You can't be an either-or <laughs> guy. It's not how it works in 2022. you got to be on one side of the fence or the other, but I, I'm on the side of the fence that, look, he's your top prospect. He's got to be playing games. The fact that he was a healthy scratch for a couple months, um, it did that didn't make any sense to me if he's your top uh, defense prospect. He's either, you know, in the lineup, which I think he's shown, he's more than capable of playing, but the problem is you got five veteran D here signed to long-term deal, so those guys are all getting in, and you basically have one spot for him or Stanley. I don't know if he's going to get in 10 of 12. Uh, he's definitely you know, shown, shown flashes at times, and, he, and he's looked like he can play. But I think it, Logan Stanley seems to have the upper hand in the eyes of the organization. And I wonder if they just rotate him in and give some of those other guys a breather. You know, we talk about playoff, slim playoff chances. Uh, Money Puck, I'm looking at it today. I like Money Puck now, Hus, because it has the, the decimal in there. Um, we got 1.1 as opposed yeah, to one yeah exactly <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> so dom at the athletic has them 99 uh, percent chance uh to not make the playoffs so one percent chance to make it money puck has a bit more than that 1.2 percent chance to make the playoffs for the jet so uh, not mathematically eliminated quite yet. I saw Connor Hellebuck saying, "Look, man, we got 12 games left. We just we just got to go 12 for 12, and we're in." So I like the optimism that they're well, saying. Hellebuck's the best. I yeah. like listen. Hellebuck <laughs> is the best, and 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 I'm sure he said that with an absolutely straight face. Oh, um, just saying, for, he's well, so serious. No, yeah. Well, what do we have to do? We've got to win 12 in a row. There yeah. you go. Let's let let's let's get after it. Starting with one tomorrow night. I do think he'll be he'll have a great game tomorrow night for his bobblehead night. First star and another fishing celebration after the game, maybe holding the bobblehead to uh, to send the fans home happy ream. Yeah, and I used to write that um, you know take note that in the early days of the bobblehead giveaways, they you know the players did not go well. I wrote about it at legalcurve.com, I think, or my personal website. But I just remember on Andre Pavlik's bobblehead night, like him getting pulled. <laughs> and smashing his stick over the post. So hopefully that does not happen. I think Bufflin, I got to got to find it. Hold on. I'll yeah, find you, it. you did do quite a, a beautiful extended history of Jets bobblehead nights. I'm thinking about the guys there's oh, a here. there's a little bobblehead. What well, did you find it? Yeah, 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 yeah. I wrote about it. So man, it's not going well. Like, hey, 2019, so 2019 Ehlers, zero points minus four on his bobblehead night. Ooh. Uh, Truba on his bobblehead night, March 20, didn't play because he had a concussion. Uh, Mark Shifley was pretty good on his bobblehead night. Uh, he had a, a goal and a point, plus two, five shots. Uh, um, Brian Little didn't play on his bobblehead night, 2016. Uh, 2014, Bufflin, zero points, minus two and a loss. Pavlik, five goals allowed in 2013. Uh, and he broke his stick. Lad, zero points in 2012, minus three. So uh, there's like been one guy who's had a successful, what, Line A's bobblehead night. Uh, he got, what, he got traded? Yeah, he got traded. He didn't even make the game that they were planning on handing the thing out. Yeah, no. I'm so, just happy that Hellebuck is healthy enough to play in this damn game tomorrow, although the uh, predicament of the team, not great. Hey, by the way, Dallas Pauls. What up, Dallas? One of our longest uh, listeners and viewers popping in, becoming a supporter. Um, we haven't mentioned this very much, but just for those of you that are on YouTube quickly, um, you'll see many of the folks with the green um, text and the microphones afterwards. Those are uh, those are members of Winnipeg Sports Talk community. It's, uh, it's at $2 a month, and there's some neat emotes and stuff. So if you are interested in doing that, another way to uh, support the channel in a, in a small way, we really do appreciate it. But Dallas, thank you very much, and welcome to the crew. 
All right. Um, we will have much more coming up. Jeff Hamilton's going to join us a little bit later on. We'll talk more Masters. Matt Wiley uh, in the second hour of the program. But coming up in just a second, we're going to talk. We're going to look into the future, the crystal ball, if you will. Jets prospects with our good friend Scott Wheeler. Uh, before we do that, a big thanks to our newest sponsor. Great to have Wallace and Wallace on board. You know them well. They are Winnipeg's fencing and overhead door specialist serving residential and commercial customers here in Winnipeg since 1946. Hey, you've seen their trucks and fences all over the city. If your property needs the security and protection of a new fence, or if winter's done a number on the old one, give them a call. Vinyl, ornamental, welded wire, chain link. I believe I called them chain line fences yesterday. I think you know that I haven't built many fences lately, but I'm familiar with the chain link style or wood fences, they have got the right fence for you. And heck, if it's time to replace your garage door, Wallace and Wallace also has Winnipeg's largest selection of overhead garage doors and the professionals to help you out make the right decisions. Give them a call at 452-2700. Ben, Charles, Mark, and the rest of the gang at Wallace and Wallace will arrange a time to come out and give you a free estimate. You can also visit them online at wallacefences.com or pop down to their showroom on Lawson Road off Keniston to check them out. Hey, we actually might have to dress up in a couple weeks for a certain event. Uh, we know that the summer's here, weddings are back, grads are back, and every guy needs at least one suit that fits and looks great. And our friends at F Apparel are here for you with Winnipeg's best custom clothing, including custom suits for men and so much more. Um, they are the top choice in Winnipeg for weddings and grad suits. If you've got a big event coming up and you need to look great, F is here for you. Custom suits starting at just $400. Uh, high school graduates will get a free shirt and tie with valid high school ID going into their grad. And if you got a wedding party coming up, talk to Andrew and the gang at F. They'll give you a 15% discount for the entire wedding party, and you guys will look amazing. F Apparel, 190 Smith Street downtown, and online at fapparel.com. And our friends at Vita Health Fresh Market, of course, seven locations in Winnipeg now continue to be stocked with Winnipeg's best selection of local, organic, and natural groceries, supplements, and beauty products, all at great prices with amazingly knowledgeable staff trained on these products to help you get the right thing for you. Uh, they've totally redone the website, fully shoppable now, so you can shop online if you want and schedule a delivery with Instacart or pop in yourself to Vita Health fresh market check out the great vita salads sandwiches and soups available at the grab and go deli another great addition um but if you want check it all out online at myvita.ca and order as well seven winnipeg locations including the newest store in linden ridge online at myvita.ca all right let's talk some hockey I, I will admit i was hoping that our discussion of jets prospects could maybe have waited till closer to the draft but with the current predicament of the club and we've been hoping to get Scott on for a while. It's a great to welcome Scott Wheeler back to the program. I believe the last time we spoke with Scott, he was just about to head out to the World Juniors. Scotty, what's going on? How are you? Yeah, I was just about to head out to the World Juniors. Then I got the two-game experience of Cole Perfetti cut a little bit short. Cole was tremendous, and I thought Canada's best player before I had to cancel my hotel and rebook my flights home. So it was... Uh... That was an eventful. That was an eventful week for me. Yeah, you know what? Just before we get into the Jets and everything, I mean, take us back to that. I mean, that, it just seemed everything about that entire scenario seemed bizarre. Um, you know, the teams coming. I mean, the amount that goes into putting on an event like that is is mind boggling. I mean, people have no idea the work that goes on behind the scenes for the amount of time that it did, and then. For the tournament to fall apart the way that it did with apparently like a wedding in the same hotel with some of the teams. I mean, uh, well, what was your first person account being there, Scott, of uh, the demise of the tournament that is now, of course, going to be rescheduled for the summer? Yeah, it's funny because I was based out of Edmonton, but everything kind of really fell apart uh, in Red Deer, right? It, it was the Red Deer setup that that was their undoing. And I did a huge feature at the on the at the athletic on that towards the end uh, or, or sort of immediately after that sort of looked at, okay, here's everything that took place in Red Deer. And you're absolutely right. There was multiple weddings, not just one. I learned that there were multiple weddings 
hosted that week. The guests and the players were using the same elevators. The players were hanging out in the bar at the bottom of this convention center in Red Deer where people were coming in and ha- locals coming in to have dinner. Um, there were shops open, hair salons. Um, it, it was it was sloppy. And that's really what was the undoing. Uh, but there was more than that. I mean, things that I never even ended up reporting, but there was a huge issue. Uh, I'm not sure if this was ever reported on, but there was a huge issue that I was able to confirm with the officials where not just in Edmonton, but in Red Deer as well, there were officials that had tested positive. So even if they could have got some of those teams back to a playable number of, of negative athletes, they were still going to have troubles with getting officials onto the ice. So it was, it was just poorly done. Uh, I do want to give them a, a little bit of the benefit of the doubt, though, if anything, because that was really as Omicron was was taking off and they had arrived in Edmonton for their pre-tournament games weeks and weeks and weeks earlier. Right. And when they'd arrived, I believe it was like December 12th or December 11th that all of the teams flew into Edmonton and got settled for the pre-tournament schedule. And as part of that, that was really the day, like the day, the 24 hours where we started hearing a lot about Omicron. And at that point, you're not going to send the kids home. They, they were pot committed. So uh, it was just really difficult timing wise because COVID was really ramping up again. Um, but part of it was that they never should have been in hotels where guests were staying there. They should have been a proper bubble like it was a year earlier successfully in Edmonton and that just wasn't the route that they went. So, well, it, you know what? You it nailed it. And, and, and it's funny you mentioned December 12th, was certainly for our audience, will uh, be a special day for everyone because that was the day the Bombers won the Grey Cup. And, you know, they came back and then did a celebration at the stadium three days later. And a few days later after that, everything's shutting down. The numbers yeah. are going through the roof. And you are right. The timing was uh, was poor. Although, um, to your point, I mean, how it was allowed to be as lax as it was, considering what we've been through for the last couple of years. Well, let's just say it's a very, very expensive decision, Scott, uh, because they're going to pull this thing back. How, just before we talk Jets, how different is this tournament going to look in August, or do we even know right now? I mean, I'm thinking about players like Cole Perfetti, who's now kind of established himself as a member of the mm-hmm. Winnipeg Jets, has had an injury that's kept him out a long time. Um, you know, What do we know about the rosters and how this tournament will look as opposed to what we thought we were getting, certainly for you and the scouts at the, uh, at the end of the previous year? Well, it's going to look different. Obviously, the Russians won't be participating in that, whether, uh, whether it's the right decision or not. I think it absolutely is the right decision. Regardless of all of that and and the politics of it, it's going to inevitably water down the event. You're going to have one of the giants not participating. And then on top of that, as you kind of alluded to, it, the conversations I've had have suggested that a lot of those kids, the NHL-ready kids who are going to be heading off to their training camps a couple of weeks after the tournament ends, those kids aren't going to be participating. You're not likely going to see Cole Perfetti, Owen Power, uh, Matt Beneers, Jake Sanderson, all of the sort of big, big, big names, the three or four kids on each team that are going to be fighting for a spot on their NHL club, I think there are very good odds that those kids don't participate. Uh, but in saying that, there is still going to be a hundred of the best prospects on the planet playing in one place. Uh, and the kids that are going to get to replace those kids, I mean, w- w- we made a huge deal the last time around uh, for the tournament about Brant Clark of the LA Kings, for example, who wasn't named to Team Canada. Maybe if Owen Power is not there, Brant Clark gets to gets to play on the team. So uh, th- there's going to be different kind of excitement. I still think it's going to be a great hockey. Uh, those kids, especially the kids that were there in Edmonton that are now all going to be invited back. My understanding is that all of the kids that were on those teams, each of the federations have decided that even if they would have played their way off the team with their play since then, all of those kids are still going to be invited back. It, they're owed that opportunity. You're going to have great stories like a Thomas Bordalo, who was supposed to be in his final World Juniors, and after testing positive two years ago at the World Juniors, tested positive again at this year's tournament and wasn't able to participate. So you're going to see a kid like Bordalo of the San Jose Sharks who thought that he was never going to get to play in the World Juniors when he was supposed to play in two tournaments now a kid like him is going to be invited back and ha- get get to live out that dream of his. So uh, it's still going to be filled with great stories. And it fills a, a, a point in the hockey schedule in August that's typically pretty quiet. So I think that'll be a lot of fun for people. 
Yeah, no doubt about that. It just Matt Savoy from the ice wasn't in the mix before. I mean, he's going to be a top 10 pick, potentially a top five pick coming up in the draft. For players mm-hmm. like that, might a guy like that get an opportunity to play in August? And, you know, if they're already a first rounder, not sure about the upcoming season. Is that the sort of player that you think might even um, be into going? I think it's going to be tricky for a player like Matt just because he wasn't even on the the camp roster in Calgary. I was in Calgary for the cuts before they named their team for Edmonton in December, and Matt wasn't even invited to that portion. So my gut would say that if if Canada loses three or four people from their roster of 22 uh, from Edmonton and they have to add three or four new names to to what their roster was previously – it's going to be the kids who were the fi- among the final cuts the first time around in all likelihood. It's going to be someone like Hendrix Lapierre, the first round pick of the Washington Capitals, who played for the Washington Capitals this season and was kind of a surprise cut at camp. Uh, so I think you're more likely to see those kinds of players added to the mix than a player like Savoy. But that doesn't mean that a few months later, when they do it all over again in December, that he's not a part of the 2023 team. And we're going to get two world juniors tournaments with within the span of five months. Right. So uh, I think you're, he's a very strong candidate. If he's not in the NHL, which I don't expect he will be. He's a very strong candidate to make the 2023 team and to be a very big part of that 2023 team. Now, Scott Wheeler, the athletic with us now, uh, Scott, we do want to talk about your top, uh, your rankings of the Jets prospects, where they rank in. But I guess one question to sort of transition from the international hockey into the Jets involves the Russians. And we'll talk about a Russian mm-hmm. player that's already drafted. But as far as this draft comes up, uh, the, the, this year's draft happens. What are you hearing from the people in the league, uh, from other scouts? How um, unique of a year is this when it comes to Russian prospects and what's it's going to, what, what will the effect of what's happening in the world be on the NHL draft? Well, it's real. Uh, I, I think there's actual real tangible hesitation from teams to take uh, Russians high in the draft in this year's draft, just because of the uncertainty around where they're going to play next year, the control or lack of control that teams may now have over what they can do with those Russian players uh, it, it's a tricky situation. I think in Danila Yurov's case, Danila, Danila Yurov is the top prospect out of Russia in this draft class. Uh, Ivan Miroshnichenko would have been in that conversation as well, but has tragically developed cancer, and, and who knows what will happen with Ivan at this point. Uh, but Danila, the, the top prospect who was should be a top 10 pick, I'll be pretty surprised if he actually is a top 10 pick. Uh, I think you'll see a kid like him. I think you'll see a kid like Gleb Trikhozov, who is kind of uh, widely regarded as a first round talent in this draft out of Russia. I think you could see him available in the second round. Uh, so it's, it, that's, it's real. Just in, in speaking with people, there's definitely some trepidation there. Well, and, and, you know, as far as the, uh, the jets list goes, I mean, we'll get to, you know, Cole and whatnot. I mean, number four is Chibrikov. Mm-hmm. who has had this great season so far. And, you know, yeah. many of us have been sort of looking and, you know, the Jets have stayed away from Russians for a while. I mean, we've got Chibrikov at four on your list and Rashevsky at number six on your list. Um, first of all, for our listeners that probably don't know very much about those players, maybe touch on where they are right now and why they why they ended up where they did on your list. But at the same time, what everything's happening to the potential of those guys being NHL players or at least even in North America in the near future. Yeah, I mean, just to touch on the players quickly, Chibrikov was a first round guy on my board last year. I I thought they did really well to nab him. Uh, I'm a big fan. He's had a very good year. He hasn't played in the KHL this year, but he has played extremely successfully in the second tier VHL, uh, which is the feeder league, the feeder professional league for the KHL. Uh, he's been like a point per game player there. He's contributing at the very top of that lineup. And I honestly think that's probably a better thing for him this year than if he were playing nine, 10 minutes a night in the KHL, like so many 18, 19 year olds often do. Uh, so it's been good. It's been a really good de- positive development here, I would argue for cheaper Cub. And with him, there was never going to be any rush. So I don't think he's particularly implicated by uh, sort of Russia's war on Ukraine. Um, it's it just, He's, he was going to stick over there and play over there for two or three years regardless. So um, 
no urgency in terms of resolving that or rushing him out of there to get him over here or that kind of a thing. I uh, wouldn't be surprised if there that's been a discussion and they've talked about maybe trying to get him over to play junior hockey over here or potentially even professional hockey over here. Uh, but uh, I still think he'll stick around. Uh, and then Ryshevsky obviously is playing in the KHL uh, and having a, a kind of a revelatory season. He's He's been a revelation in the hockey world and has really uh, improved his stock in a big way. He was an overager when he was drafted, and he's been a top six, top nine contributor for a good KHL team this season. And that is no small thing, even as a, a an overager. So uh, it, it's been it's been really fun to watch Rashevsky play. He in particular, excuse me, he in particular has changed markedly changed his outlook. Uh, and if you were to look back at the draft, he's probably one of ten guys who's improved his stock the most. Scott Wheeler's with us. Scott, let's talk about the rest of the list. And um, well, overall. Cole Perfetti is a guy we've talked a lot about. And um, since we yeah. spoke, we got a chance to see him play quite a bit. Unfortunate injury suffered against the Kraken, a bit of a setback in the rehab. You know, from hearing Coach Dave Lowry so far, I mean, I'm not sure how much hockey he's going to be playing, if any, before the end of the season. Um, that being said, from World Juniors to Moose to National Hockey League, Tell us your thoughts on Perfetti, why he's the Jets' number one prospect, and uh, how tantalizing he should be to Jet fans for how he projects to be a regular in the bigs. Yeah, so it's tricky with Cole because I actually think he was having it under weird circumstances and obviously playing at two different pro levels and playing ever so briefly at the World Juniors. I thought he was having a positive season. and he, I mean, he was tremendous at the World Juniors. That's without question. He, was, he looked really, really good. Um, and really good in contrast to his centerman, which was Shane Wright. It was funny because Shane Wright almost looked invisible, and yet Cole Perfetti was the best player on the ice, and they were playing on the same line. So, uh, yeah, that was great. I thought I, it, whenever I watched him with the Moose, he was tremendous. He was creating even when the points weren't going in, which happened for a brief stretch. Uh, I thought he was extremely impactful, shift to shift, night to night, dangerous on the power play finding pockets of space like he does so beautifully. And then it was just starting to come for him, I thought. I thought he was just starting to play his best hockey in the NHL to date uh, in in sort of January, February after the World Juniors. So it's a, it's a tough situation. I'm sure he's disappointed by the way that things are going to finish here for him. But in saying that, I think Cole is a fabulous kid and talent. I'm a big, big fan of Cole Perfetti. Uh, he's first of all, a wonderful kid. And I don't often say that about hockey players. They can be, they can be tricky to get to know and to appreciate. Um, and Cole's not one of those kids. And then the hockey player, I think is it, just as, if not more impressive, I, I, there's been questions about his skating and his size and yada, yada, yada. And I, I am honestly not worried about any of those things whatsoever. Uh, he reads the ice and understands the game as well as any kid his age does, He's got excellent, excellent sort of soft skills, his hands, his shot, his ability to feather passes into space, all of that. And even if he's never going to overwhelm someone with power or speed, I think all of the other tools that make a successful NHL are today, the problem solving, the the reads, uh, all of that is high end. So I, I think he's going to be a true top six playmaking forward in the NHL who's on your top power play unit. And those guys are hard to come by. Well, I mean, he was clearly at the top of your list. There was one other guy in that top tier, and it was last year's first rounder, Chaz Lucius, who, uh, you know, made the move to the NCAA. What did you think about the pick when the Jets made it? And uh, what have you learned about Chaz from uh, the time he was drafted until our conversation today, Scott? Yeah, well, I was a huge fan of of the pick when they made it. Chaz uh, was a player who I did a big feature on last year to get to know really what happened with his knee and what the injury was and how serious it was and the grueling return that he had to come back from it. And Chaz is a kid who, a lot like Cole, honestly, really, really impressed me in the reporting of that story and is a kid who is beloved basically everywhere he's ever been and not in the cliched kind of ways, like truly he has left a mark on people. Uh, and the injury wasn't as sort of long lasting as I think many teams believed it to be. And, and because of that, I think the, the Jets did good to land him where, where they did. He was truly one of the best scorers of the draft, all of that. And then this year, a bit of a mixed year for him as well. He's currently out. Minnesota is 
on their way to the Frozen Four. I fly out to Boston tomorrow to to catch them play in the semis, and he's not going to be participating because of a foot injury, completely independent of the very serious knee problem that he was dealing with uh, a year ago. So the foot injury has ended his season early, and before the foot injury, it was a bit of a mixed bag. He got up to a hot start and then hit a really cold spell, really bad cold spell, and then was fabulous in the second half like one of the best players on one of the best teams in the country one of the top freshmen scoring and creating offense like like we're used to seeing out of Chaz uh and then obviously the foot the foot injury which is uh, apparently also pretty serious so um yeah it's it's been tricky with Chaz just because of the injury history but when he's on the ice he is a dynamic goal scorer uh, and I think an underrated passer and playmaker as well uh, and one of those kids whose fire is just going to take him as far as his talent will allow him. And I think he's got plenty of talent. So between him and Cole, I think they've got two future impact guys. And I'm a big fan of both. I mean, I think uh, we'd all agree that Cole Perfetti in all likelihood fits into the Jets plans next season. Uh, how much more time do you think um, Lucius uh, will be in the NCAA? Is it likely that he's back next year? And, uh, wh- uh, you know, what's his development path? One more year is is probably the play for him. A lot like players like Matt Bowlby who are breaking into the scenes now. Uh, Alex Newhook. It, it's becoming increasingly, I think one and done is still happening, but increasingly a lot of kids are encouraged to spend two years. Cole Caulfield spent two years when he wanted to only spend one and the, the Montreal Canadiens insisted that he go back and Obviously, he then won the Hobie Baker and was the best player in college hockey in his sophomore year. So I think same kind of path for a lot of these sort of top 10, top 20 picks nowadays, where instead of the one and dones of old, it's it's typically two and done. And I think that'll be good for Chaz and, and maybe even three for him just because of the lost time. He, he's really lost within the last two years, probably about a year of that in totality now to to injuries. Right. So. Uh, it's, it's been a difficult challenge for him with, with the knee and now the foot, uh, and hopefully he can just have a full healthy season next year, really light it up at the top of uh, the golden Gophers lineup. And then you take it from there. Scott, we've talked about the top two prospects as well as the two Russians, the rest of the group, but I'll go with it. Vili Hanel is at number three, mm-hmm. David Gustafson's at number five, Dylan Sandberg's at number seven. And Christian Veselainen is number eight. And what's interesting about that is that Veselainen, more than any of those players, maybe more than any player we've seen in recent history, um, has sort of gone away from the Jets' plan of keeping guys in the you know, in the American League for a long, long time, then bringing them up. Mm-hmm. And to be honest, he's sort of gone the wrong way this season. Did not yes. do much in about fifty games, and now he's you know back with the Manitoba Moose. While Billy Hainala, albeit spending considerable time in the press box, has been back, has been looking good. And I mean, David Gustafson's season was so snake bit. He continues to be a standout at the AHL level. And in his two call-ups, got injured five minutes into both games and then went back. And we've sort of been waiting for him to return to the mix. Um, And I think Dylan Sandberg in his NHL debut showed that he was ready. And one guy that's not on that list, and maybe he's too old now to be considered a prospect because of when he was drafted, has been a bit of a revelation this year too, and that's Johnny Kovacevic. Um, mm. If you could just touch on this group of players that have been drafted by the Jets that are in your top 10 that have been playing the majority of the season in the American Hockey League and you know their progression as we get to uh, hopefully see them as regulars with Winnipeg. Yeah, well, I think Hainola is going to be a second-pairing guy. That's kind of always been my projection for Hainola, and it's still my projection for Hainola. He's going to be a three to five defenseman somewhere in that range more likely a four uh and i i like that I, that's an important piece i think that's a good pick in the in the late first round so hey is a kid that i'm i'm fond of he's grown increasingly more ambitious over the years he used to be i found him to be a, a very deferential player he would just kind of make the right smart play every time and that turned him into a first round prospect but i it's been nice to see him come out of his shell and use his skating more and try to do more with the puck uh, and I think that will help him at the next level because he's capable of playing that way. So I still like Hainola a lot. Obviously, you t- you touched on Gustafson this year. It's just been a weird year for him because I think he's an NHLer in my books. If he's healthy and and he's sort of playing every day, I think he's in, he's one of the 12 forwards who should be in the mix for the Jets. 
so the, I, I still expect that to happen. And with him, it's less a prospect at this point and more just a, this is who he is. And he's just going to be a, a contributing sort of bottom six guy. That's, that's what I imagine for Gustafson. Uh, obviously, Veselainen is, is, and I wrote this in, in my piece, but he's just a complete, a complete enigma, I, I think, is the word that I would use. He is he should be a better hockey player than he is. I've written this repeatedly over the years. I've done a lot of video work on him. He showed so much promise early in his career in Europe, uh, not just in Sweden, but even in, in Finland. Uh, and then it just has not worked out for him because he can't figure out what he what his niche is. And he's not a sort of bottom six guy who plays well when he's getting nine minutes a night. And he's not, he hasn't proven talented enough or quick enough to play in a prominent role, which means you just end up being that weird tweener who's an AHLer at the end of the day. And I think that's kind of where I am on best alignment at this point. And I, my list was released in February, but put together kind of December, January, and he'd be even lower. He'd go from eight to, I don't know, 11 or 12 at this point. Um, and then the other names, I mean, Sandberg, uh, I think it's been a good year, just a solid year for him. Uh, I think he's on a fine track to become an everyday NHL defenseman. I don't think there's a lot to write home about his game. He's a big kid who can really skate, and that is a huge asset in today's NHL. Uh, he's very strong. The offense that he had in the, in, in the latter years of his college career, I think, was skewed by the fact that he was just a top prospect and they played him on the power play. And he's never going to touch a power play in, in the NHL. That's just not really his game. Uh, and then you get to, after those sort of seven, after Perfetti, Lucius, Hinola, Chubrikov, Gustafsson, Ryshevsky, Sandberg, after those seven, it really does drop off. I, I think Dmitry Kuzmin is interesting. I think he's had a fine first year in the OHL, maybe a little bit below my expectations uh, in terms of his first year in the OHL. And then you get into guys like uh, Anton Johansson, who is, a, again, another player who just can't stay healthy. And we don't really know what he is, despite being a very entertaining defenseman to watch at the junior level in Sweden. So uh, you after those seven, it, it, you start to get into the, the lottery balls, if you will. Uh, but the other player you mentioned who, you're right, due to being 23 and over wasn't eligible for my list is Kovacevic, who, uh, again, another guy that I see as kind of a tweener. I see him as a, as a depth piece who uh, has obviously established himself in the AHL as a very good player. And then in the NHL, I think he's, he's more of just a guy, uh, an option. And they've got a lot of those. I, I, I like Leon, uh, honestly, more than I think most people like Leon. I think he can be a guy uh, and just good organizational depth in case of injuries. And De I mean, we, we didn't touch on Declan who I think is got a chance to become a guy, but a, a lot of those players are just going to end up being organizational depth. And I think it's really that top seven that I mentioned who I think have a chance to be more than, than call up options in terms of their ceilings. Scott, I always love these conversations. I mean, uh, really appreciate the work that you do. Um, just on the way out, um, not really as it pertains to the Jets, but the draft overall, it's been about Shane Wright all season long. We've heard that maybe there were some guys that were pushing. I mean, uh, how clear is the top of the draft to you right now? Is Shane Wright still the top? And who are the guys that are pushing him for that number one selection in Montreal? Yeah, I've got a four. Uh, my final list won't be out until after I get out to Germany for under 18 worlds, but I've really got a, a strong group of four at the top. It's Shane one for me. And then there's three after that, that I've, I've been flip-flopping on kind of all season. I, I think I'll settle two, three on either Winnipeg's Matt Savoy, who I'm a big, big fan of. I think he's more likely going to go in the five to 10 range, but I really like him as a top four guy in this draft. So Savoy will be two or three, and then uh, Slovak defenseman Simon Nemitz will be two or three. And you will quite likely see Logan Cooley, the center out of the National Development Program, as the number four guy. So in that group, you've got three centers between Savoy, uh, Cooley, and, and Shane Wright, and one defenseman in Nemitz, who I really, really like, and has is in the midst of a fabulous, fabulous playoffs over in Slovakia right now. So 
Um, th- those are those are really the the cream of the crop in this draft class for me. Those four guys. Scott, thank you so much for doing this. It's always a pleasure having you on the show. Keep up the great work along with our friends over at the Athletic and uh, travel safely before uh, you got to get that final list ready for the summer. Yeah, eight a.m. to uh, eight a.m. flight to Boston tomorrow, so it's going to be an early one for me. Frozen Four should be a lot of fun. We'll look forward to your coverage and uh, everything on the tournament at the Athletic. Thanks so much for the time, Scott. Really appreciate it. Cheers. Good stuff. There's Scott Wheeler. Give him a follow on Twitter. Uh, and of course, check out all of his work at The Athletic. All right, we're going to uh, get the latest on the Jets and the thoughts of the one and only Jeff Hamilton coming up in just a second. Um, a cheers to our friends at Culligan Water who have been the family owned leaders when it comes to the water business in Winnipeg and Southern Manitoba for over 65 years. Culligan has whatever you need for your family or your business. Water softeners, filters, bottled water coolers, whole home systems, drinking water systems, and citywide water delivery services as well. In addition to that, they've got commercial and industrial water products and solutions for your business. Whatever you need when it comes to the best water in town, call the good folks at Culligan. They're at 1200 Sergeant Avenue, 694-5180. And you can find out more online at drinkculligan.com. Donnie and the guys at Manitoba Battery are ready for spring, as we all are right now. Gone are the days of long lineups of people whose car batteries are done and they need a new one at the best price and go to Manitoba Battery. Now we're getting ready for spring cleaning and summer fun. Uh, All those tools you're going to be needing on your project right now or for your big cleanups, uh, Manitoba Battery's got you covered there. And as we look ahead into the summer, whether it is for a boat, an ATV, a farm tractor, or more, uh, Manitoba Batteries got whatever you need for your work or your play when it comes into the summer. And they deliver anywhere in the city with same-day delivery when you order by 1.30 in the afternoon at a much lower price than what you'd have to pay at one of the big box stores. Manitoba Battery is the home of the best prices in Winnipeg for whatever your battery needs. 1026 Logan, 783 and online over at manitobabattery.com. And a big cheers to our friends at Royal Sports. I personally am counting down the days to get my hands on a Team Canada soccer jersey. They've got a truckload of merch on the way. We'll let you know when it arrives, and uh, you can be the first to uh, grab your jersey ahead of our trip to the World Cup. Uh, But right now, whether it's Jets merchandise, bomber gear going up, NFL, Blue Jays with the excitement of the Blue Jays season coming up, it is all there ready for you, not to mention soccer, baseball, softball, and an incredible bike section. And they do need people to work in the bike shop too. So if you've got someone that loves bikes and loves working on them, tell them to head on down to Royal and uh, talk to the guys there about working there for the summer. Royal Sports, 750 Pemina Highway, more information available on everything going on at Royal on their Instagram feed at Royal Sports Pemina. All right, Masters discussion coming up later on with Matt Wiley from Golflandia. Right now, though, it is the return of boom, the Hammer, Jeff Hamilton, with us on Winnipeg Sports Talk. Hammer, what's good, man? Great to have you back on the show. Not much, Haas. It's gloomy out there, but it's a sunny one in here, so let's uh, let's get her going. Yeah, well, at least we're getting up to six or seven. I mean, I'll say this about the weather. Uh, You know, it has been an underwhelming spring, but I think we all knew the situation that we were in heading out of the driest summer ever. We got a ton of snow, a slow melt, no flood problems. So I think we'll take it, but it will be nice. You know, the Masters is here. We should be teeing it up at Breezy Bend very soon and uh, might be waiting a few weeks for that. That being said, um. I don't think anyone in the Jets organization thought that we'd be talking about Tiger Woods teeing it up and about Jets prospects this morning on the program, considering that there's a dozen games left in the season. But uh, I'm sure you're of the opinion that um, we're pretty much now into next year territory after that disappointing loss to the Kings. And of course, the uh, Leafs doing the big reversal after the nice start for the Jets in that game last Thursday. Well, I think it really depends on your belief meter. I mean, some people have been not all that believing for a while now, maybe even for, uh, you know, months. Whereas there's some that, uh, you know, looked at the last month that the Jets had, you know, month of March and, and seen what, what kind of damage they've been able, been able to do. I mean, if you looked at the record, I, I keep 
screwing this up, but it's something like whatever, 15, four and one or, or whatnot dating back even before March. And it was like the highest amount of points uh, amongst any, any, any NHL teams, all 32. So, you know, there was a little bit of hope, but even then the hole was really big. So it was these past two games really that created, I think, a lot of the doubt for people. I mean, you know, the LA Kings were a big one. There's no doubt, you know, Toronto was going to be a tough opponent, but they needed that one too. Uh, they need all of them. And so, you know, I think it's pretty safe to say now that this team is, you know, what, whatever word you want to use, screwed, not destined for the playoffs, whatever it might be. Done. Um, <laughs> done would be, a, would be a, a good word. Um, I don't think that they're believing that in the locker room. And I don't think until the, these guys are mathematically eliminated which might come sooner than later are we sure um, though because i'll be honest i mean i go to all these games it sort of looked on the first period against the L la kings like certainly that didn't look like a team that realized oh my god if we don't come out and play the way we can our season's done i mean and that's been a story that has been repeated over the last little while and listen if there is still belief in that room it really makes you wonder what the heck they're thinking going out for some of these games with the pedestrian starts that they've had yeah, absolutely. And we're going to go by their starts. They've been out for a month. <laughs> even during the stretch, even during the stretch where they were racking up wins, their starts were horrible. I'm talking more about roster decisions. I mean, there's got the fact of the matter is until healthy, you know, healthy guys are are removed from the lineup, you know, and, and no one's really healthy at this stage of the season, right? There's going to be a handful of guys in there that are playing through some some pretty crappy things. Until those guys are plucked out of the, the the lineup, I think I'm I'm just going strictly basis on a roster situ, you know roster situation here and and where you know this team still believes. I mean, you even hear Connor Hellebuck today. The mindset is to go 12 and 12. Well, this team hasn't has only put together four game win streak this season. So you know, as delirious as that might sound, you know the the fact of the matter is they don't have any other choice. I mean, they they don't control their destiny in a lot of ways. They do need help from other teams. That's also been a theme for the last, you know, few weeks, if not months. And, uh, you know, and, and, but, but they still need to fight. I mean, they're not going to, you know, as much as we've seen their starts be garbage and they have certainly been that. And more often than not, um, until this team is mathematically limited, I, I don't think you're going to see the, you know, the, the push or the movement, if you will, from, you know, the prospects getting more time or, or maybe different looks on lineups or seeing guys, you know, see what they can get with more responsibility. We haven't hit that stage. Practice doesn't indicate we're hitting that stage. And I think it's pretty safe to say that although there are a lot of different things you could point to to say this team's been out for a while, uh, until we start seeing kind of those things happen in the roster, um, you know, it's kind of weirdly enough status, status quo. Well, um, let me ask you this. And we talked about this a little bit yesterday on the program, and obviously nothing's changed. You know, there was just a couple days of practice and then we'll get back at it tomorrow against the Detroit Red Wings. But I'm interested in your opinion on Dave Lowry's situation right now. I mean, he's an interim head coach who's pretty clear that I think, you know, hey, you're coming in in a very unique situation. You get two games in and then have two and a half weeks of practice, which I think really did hurt the team. I mean, you often see those coaching bumps, and I know it was sort of progressed that, hey, this is great. You're able to work on things for two weeks with the team and then get out and play some games. And they came out and won those games right out of Christmas and got that in that three game winning streak that wasn't <laughs> duplicated until last week. Mm -hmm. um, but I mean, in a lot of ways, this was his opportunity to show that he could be the next guy to be the head coach of the Winnipeg Jets. And with the results that they've had under Dave Lowry up until this point, I mean, I think that the entire coaching staff is probably a pretty tough sell. I mean, I think everyone is expecting some changes around here. Um, so where does that leave Dave Lowry with 12 games left in this season right now? I mean, is he still trying to press all the right buttons to show that, you know, he's the guy next year? Or um, does Kevin Sheveldayoff come down and say, Dave, this is where we're at right now. These are the things that we need to do going forward for the organization and maybe have a little bit of a different mindset when it comes to the lineup card as well as who plays in this final dozen games. Well, yeah, I mean, just to feed off the end of my last answer, I think they're, you know, I think those meetings are generally the same as of right now. Again, the situation is a lot more dire even than it was, of course, two games ago after losing those two games. They're not mathematically limited. I imagine those those the, those talks, which happen daily, uh, are pretty much to keep trying to put out the best lineup to win um, until that becomes an obvious situation where it's not or, a, you know, a, factual situation again mathematically eliminated then i don't see those conversations changing much as for dave lowry i mean 
who knows? I mean, who knows with this organization, um, you know, what they plan to do. Uh, I mean, we do know a few things. Paul Maurice left. Uh, it was a massive surprise to the leadership. No one saw it coming. So, I mean, how much of that plays into things where it's like, okay, well, you know, whether he was fired or not, usually you have a little bit of, usually when the coach is fired, whether it's, you know, a lot of those decisions are made kind of last minute. So you could make the argument that, um, or maybe not last minute, but to actually pull the trigger, you're not really talking to the assistant coach on, you know, what his new role may or, you know, might be in the coming days or weeks. So it's usually is a last second thing. Um, but how much does that factor into it? The fact that, you know, he, you know, had a coach ultimately leave, um, you know, it does lead lead to an opportunity here. I do think that when, you know, Dave Lowry took over the position, it was going to be like most, you know, coaches who have that interim tag. It's going to depend on what you're able to do from the moment you take over to the end of the season. Um, if you get it early enough, which you could easily make the argument, um, you know, that, that Dave Lowry took over early enough in December to turn a team around and make the playoffs. That's, you know, that certainly needs to be factored in. And ultimately, you need to decide what your team is going to look like and what vision you want to have. Is, is, has Dave Lowry done enough in the, you know, on the ice? You could probably argue no. Uh, you know, this team's been susceptible to a lot of the same things they were susceptible to, particularly in the defensive zone under, you know, Paul, Paul Maurice's leadership. So there doesn't feel like a lot of improvements here. Um, you know, but again, I mean, I think it really does come down to, to what your vision is. And if Dave Lowry's, you know, you have to decide as an ownership and a management team, what, you know, what kind of factors are in play here under what happened with, with Dave Lowry. I also find it kind of interesting and maybe it's not an issue in the dressing room, but to me, it is kind of weird that his son plays for the team. Like I just, I just, I don't know why I can't seem to get past it. Maybe I need to, maybe, you know, whatever, but it just seems like a weird wrinkle to me. Um, you know, obviously this is a massive off season. You know, we talked about this last week in the sense of, you know, uh, what, what kind of guy do they want to bring in? What kind of guy does the Jets need? Do the Jets need someone who's going to bust balls? I think you can certainly make that argument like a Daryl Sutter or a Bruce Boudreaux, which, you know, I think we've saw glimpses of Dave Lowry kind of live up to that promise, if you will, that if you're not playing, you know, your best hockey, you're not going to be playing. Certainly that's kind of waned. Um, as 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 the stakes have gotten higher with you know as the seasons moved on as we've seen you know whether it be with Mark Scheifele or Blake Wheeler both of whom have had good occurrences on the ice but have you know have also had stretches where it suggested they don't need as big a role of, as they've been getting and we've seen other younger players make similar mistakes to to older veteran players and get punished more so that's kind of fallen off a little bit I I really do think you know. Whether whether or not, like, I don't think you're going to see Dave Lowry if the Jets don't make the playoffs. I mean, if the Jets make the playoffs, Dave Lowry probably, I'm going to say, writes his ticket, but probably gets another year because he, you know, inspired these guys to pretty much win out the rest of the season. But if he doesn't, I don't think you're looking at an immediate termination for him, um, unless they've been doing their homework behind the scenes and 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 trying to find that right person for the job. And so uh, I don't see that happen at this moment. I think the focus is probably on this season still, but that could, as we know could shift fairly quickly. Um but I just I don't know what you what what you're going to do. I don't think you can go for more reasons than just performance and performance is obviously a huge one. Um go into next season with this fan base under the same leadership. I just don't think you can whether that be on the coaching staff and or the players. I think this is going to be a fascinating offseason for the Winnipeg Jets. We don't know what the future of Mark Shifley is. We know that when it comes to key players like a Mark Shifley, uh, you want to have that communication with a coach. Maybe there's a head coach that comes in and says, I don't want to trade Mark Shifley. You guys are crazy. You're just not utilizing him the way you should be utilizing. So there's so many different factors in, in play here. But I will make it because you asked, it, uh, asked about Dave Lowry. I think it's a tough sell. I think it really is a tough sell uh, to the fan base. And as, we, as we've seen this season, apathy is, has crept into the point where a lot of people just don't give a shit anymore. And, and can, you really, can you really just do this, the same thing over and, and, and please those people? I know the offseason, you know, time away from the ice, which I think a lot of fans maybe need this year, um, you know, might, might erase some of those memories. But if you end up going back into the scene – next season under the same leadership under some coaching staffs like I you know I'm not trying to be a jerk or anything but Charlie heidi has been here for what 12 years like how many coaches survived that many head coaches 
Um, especially when, you know, a big part of your issues is the defensive game. I think, you know, and, and that's also not even to consider necessarily if Kevin Shevelday off is, is all secure in his job. Um, I'm certainly, I think he's probably more secure than, than Dave Lowry. Cause I think it's easy to say, you know, what he did in the off season to address some of their needs, you know, he did and the players just didn't deliver. Um, but all around, I feel like it's going to be a tough sell. And you, you know, for a fact that with, you know, declining attendance and, and all those, all those things to the bottom line that, you know, it's not going to be one of those things where we're just going to do this and we don't, you know, I'm not saying that this is what they've done in the past, but we don't care what the fans think. I think you actually have to care exactly what the fans think well, because they're the ones that pay the bills. It's funny you say that. And listen, I don't want to say they have taken the fan base for granted, but, you know, it's... I would. It's, it's, a, it's a very... It, well, listen, I mean, you can make that argument at times, but... You know, things are different when you've got a long waiting list and you're full and you don't have to spend a dime on selling season tickets or marketing anything. And because, you know, people are so all in and I, there's no doubt about it. I mean, these last few seasons have really eroded that. And you know, I've said this a million times before. I thought pre pandemic with what had happened in the 18, 19 season into that next year, that there was a reckoning coming for the organization. There was going to be a market correction. I mean, with the prices, increases of everything, with the way people were in their lives, with the fact that, you know, you had a bunch of people that were on board in 2011 that are 10 years older. I mean, some of your most expensive seats are probably purchased by, you know, business people and people that had, had seats back into 1.0. Well, I mean, if you're 65 at that point when you're getting the seats, you're 75 or 76 now, and there is an attrition, and you need to be, you know, replenishing that group. And I think we've all seen, we've read the letter that the organization sent out from Mark Chippen earlier. I mean, it was clear for the first time that there was a real impetus and I think an urgency from the uh, from the organization to convince people that they are on the right track, that they're worthy of the support, to keep people's faith in and bottom line support of the team going forward. And I, you're exactly right, Jeff. Um, this off season, considering the expectations and the disappointment that this regular season has been, will be different than any we've other we've seen before. Because I think at any point they thought, hey, listen, there'll be people that'll be saying a bunch of stuff on Twitter or whatever. I mean, you can always put that in the in the rear view. And I and I will also say, and any people that spend a lot of time on social media. Don't take too much from the angry people that are always tweeting because that's not always the same from the rest of the fan base. I mean, usually it's actually quite different. It's a way more extreme element of it. But make no mistake about it. There is a level of frustration. And there's a lot of people that are not in that group that have moved away or making different decisions with their money. And that has to be the biggest concern to True North going forward. So, you know, when you have this much talent on the team and you go through a season where your expectations are here and the performance is here, um, you know, running it back and hoping things happen in a different way, I don't think is going to do what they need to do on the business side of things. And that's why I expect significant change really for the first time, I think, at any point in the last 10 years with this with this hockey team. Are you suggesting the five year plan is over, Huss? Are you suggesting that they need to, you know, rebuild or, or retinker? I like to use. I, I think there's a couple things in there. One you know, going back to kind of Mark Chipman's letter, there's absolutely no doubt about it. Mark Chipman wants to build a winner. You know what I mean? And oh. it's fully committed to building a winner. I don't They're know if there's a more the competitive. Market. Well, I mean, that's what I was just about to say was that, you know, you know, he's a competitive man. He, you know, he loves his team. He wants to do well for the city. He wants the team to do well for a city. He's willing to spend to that salary cap, you know, ceiling to create a winner um, all those are all the things you want in an owner in that respect are there. It's just sometimes things don't work out or the people you put in charge aren't getting the jobs done. And I think that's ultimately what we're dealing with here is that you're kind of getting the same thing, whether it's drafting the same type of player, whether it's not being able to, you know, just address maybe what this team's identity is. I think that's been the the biggest problem here is that, you know, I have this feeling that, this identity that's been created, you know, now with Dave Lowry, but before for years under Paul Maurice was just never the identity that this team was built for. And I think we're coming, you know, a lot of people will be screaming at their, their computers right now saying that they've been saying this forever and, and that, you know, this just, but I just really do think the philosophy that, you know, that this team drafts skilled, you know, players, right. Not all that big players, skilled, fast, whatever. And they're, you know, they're expected to play this hard defensive you know, 200 foot, 
crazy game. And I think the reality is, is they just haven't been shown a blueprint really since they've been good on how to maximize that talent. Now, maybe, I mean, certainly you can make the argument in the 2018 playoff run, this team was a, you know, a a real juggernaut that they did a lot of great things, but I, you know, you, you could also probably make that argument that they'll never have that kind of depth again, you know, particularly on defense. And even though they address the defensive issues from previous years, you know, and, and I think the additions to, you know, Brendan, of Brendan Dillon and Nate Schmidt are certainly upgrades. They aren't the same group of defensemen that they had all, you know, during that run. So that, so to me, like, I just, I wonder, you know, I, I'd be fascinated to have, somebody come in you know as they if they if they do ultimately find a coaching search I think it'd be interesting to see what you know whether it be veteran coaches or whomever ends up getting the job comes in and looks at this roster and just absolutely pitches you know this beautiful plan to Mark Chipman and what he believes specific and to Kevin Sheveldayoff as well to you know what what he envisions the you know the the identity of this team not just envisions the identity but how he's going to get that out of the players and what he plans to do because this team is talented I mean on paper you know you hear that a lot and I know people want to roll their eyes to it but on paper this team isn't bad you know they have a good group of players they have the the tools that you need they have high end scoring they have strong goaltending you know they have you know they have pretty decent defense even though their structure isn't all that great. Um, team structure that is not just the defenseman but overall defensive game um, but I just would be interested in seeing maybe a fresh perspective and and, and if you're in the camp or if it doesn't really matter what fans think to be honest or, or what, what media thinks or anybody outside of the people making the decisions but you really need to think long and hard about who is the right person to come in and make waves with this and who has the personality to get these guys going because whether it's slow starts or just what we've seen pretty much all season not a lot of motivated minds in there. It seems like, you know, I've never seen a team apparently gel so well and care so much, but when it comes to puck drop, it's just absolutely invisible. And, and you know, that's what we saw all season in your right house, just to kind of steal what you said right off the top. The expectations were heavy coming into this season, big time. This was supposed to be a team that was supposed to contend for the Stanley Cup. This is a team that will eventually miss out on it and change has to come. It's just, you know, at this point, it's where do you point to and, and you know, how much shifting do you want to get done? Yeah, I mean, I, I think back to, you know, some of the conversations that we had and the other guys around the beginning of the season. And, you know, we were talking about particular players and Andrew Cobb's name kept coming up because he was the odd man out last summer when they were extending players and trying to keep the group together. And I said, well, listen, I mean, if we're talking about Andrew Cobb being traded or if Andrew Cobb is not on this team post-trade deadline, that means that this has been a disastrous year because, I mean, their plan is to have Andrew Kopp play this season, have a strong playoff run. If their potential is to re-sign him afterwards, great. But if not, they believe in this group this year. Well, Andrew Kopp's not here. And the reason for that is that, you know, Kevin Chevaldeoff was able to read the writing on the wall and do what was best for the organization. But make no mistake about it, that wasn't part of the plan. And, uh, and here we are right now going into 12 games that, um, you know, for better or worse, are basically just going to have effect on what happens with the, uh, you know, with the draft and where the team picks. But also very importantly, I think is about, and you kind of touched on this, is when do you get to see a few more of these younger players? I mean, I would like to see Billy Hano play all of the games, to be perfectly honest with you, or at least play while he's up with the Winnipeg Jets. And if he's not playing, get him back to the Moose to play and get ready for the Calder Cup run. Um, I think there's an argument to be made, and I know when I kind of said this at the beginning of the show, and for whatever reason, and maybe this is a social media thing, you know, everyone that's a big Billy guy has to, you know, be totally negative on Logan Stanley and vice versa. To me, both of those guys should be in the lineup going forward. I mean, those are the guys that have the most to gain from these final 12 games. I mean, it's not Neil Pionk, it's not Nate Schmidt, it's not Brendan Dillon. It's the young guys that, you know, do project to be part of this club next season and beyond. And if you're not making the playoffs, let's make the most of these final 12 games. So I mean, this kind of goes back to my original question about how Dave Lowry is going to be handling things. I mean, do they play this game as if oh, they're playing for their lives and this is it each and every night? Or do you read the room and say, you know, what's best for the Winnipeg Jets? Billy Hano playing, you know, 18 minutes a night. Logan Stanley playing with a couple different partners, you know, you know, doing those sort of things that might actually have a tangible benefit beyond this season because I think most of this season and the expectation and hopes are pretty much in the rear view. Anyone who thinks that this team until they are mathematically eliminated is going to somehow in, you know, insert 
a bunch of guys from the moose or bring in guys that have been regular scratches. Uh, you know, I hate to be the bearer of bad and obvious news, but it's not happening. I mean, it's just not, it's not happening that way. I mean, this team, you know, it, very much like they handled the trade deadline. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Was the plan to get rid of Andrew Copper, the trade deadline, if this team was primed to make the playoffs, 0% chance. That was an obvious one, but at, at the same time, I mean, it was a sneak into this team's kind of current philosophy and that's hold on, until we're until they rip it from our hands i mean the fact that they that yeah they got rid of andrew cop they needed to you know that was a simple asset management thing and a little bit of a reality check and the fact that you're probably not making the playoffs or at least you have a very very steep hill to climb and not being able to get you know the the what they eventually got potentially you know a first round pick but certainly a guaranteed two round two second round picks and more um you know is is ultimately you know it's way better than not having that. And you ha- and so in a lot of ways, that was their first real glimpse of looking into the future rather than the present. But until that present means no playoffs guaranteed, uh, you're not going to see, you know, a bunch of guys coming up from the moose. You're not going to see, you're most likely not going to see, you know, barring injury, you know, Logan Stanley and, and Billy Hanela in the lineup together. I mean, we'll have to wait and see and, and figure that out. I mean, until, you know, Nate, Nathan Bolio was, was, was traded, um, and other things happened. I mean, Billy Hanalo wasn't a slam dunk. Like I remember being in Dallas for that game when he would he was sent home prior to that road trip, uh, that four game road trip. And you know, the, from talking to people within the organization, I mean, it was very clear that this was the mm-hmm. roster they were going to ride until the playoffs were no longer. You know, you know, <laughs> I don't even know if they were possible really at that point, or they're very least in tough position. But you know that was the lineup they were going to run. Billy Hainel wasn't part of that. But I mean, as soon as that happens, I mean, it, it, it would to me. I think it has to be a literally an overnight uh, situation where if you know the Jets have a you know the loss that ultimately is the nail in their coffin. Um, you have to bring up guys like Sandberg, Chisholm, you know, guys up front, like give Jeff Mott, you know, opportunities, give, you know, some of the, you know, some of the guys you acquired, uh, you know, Morgan Barron, those kind of guys, better opportunities up with the, with the club to see what they can do. And not just, you know, not just gain a chance to play with the Jets, but the chance to gain meaningful, you know, reps, meaningful competition up against, you know, see what you have in guys and see what they, you know, see what they do with the opportunity. But until, like I said, like I said earlier in the, in in the interview, until this team is mathematically eliminated, don't expect, you know, guys that, you know, guys to come up and start, you know, start getting some, you know, crazy opportunity unless they get, you know, hit with COVID again or, or, or an un, another unfortunate circumstance. Yeah, well, one guy that's seemingly going to get a bit more of an opportunity, I would imagine, starting tomorrow is Morgan Barron. And part of that is the fact that he's with the club and now Jansen Harkins is uh, will be out for tomorrow's game day to day right now. He's in concussion protocol. We certainly hope that, J- that Hark's able to get back soon. But I'll tell you what, I went to the Moose game last Tuesday and Barron really stood out, as did Jeff Mallott. And doing all the things that we hear Dave Lowry preach over and over again, take the puck hard to the net, be in those greasy areas. And, um, and, and you know, certainly were players that, um, you know, that have been producing for the, for the Manitoba Moose. Barron comes in and plays some spot duty. And we've talked about the situation. The minute you get down, I mean, Dave Lowry's not leaning on that fourth line in games with the predicament that they have been in. No. Um, but much like we've talked about some of the defensemen getting into the lineup, getting some significant minutes for players like a Morgan Barron to have a better idea of what you have going into next season is another thing that I'd like to see. But it was interesting to see him, you know, after Harkins was injured, get moved up and get a couple shifts with some of the top lines on uh, on Saturday night against the LA Kings. And um, to me, these next few games, I mean, if the lineup is the way that it is, we'll be talking about whichever the young defensemen are playing. We'll be comparing it to the other guy that's not in the lineup. And everyone will have the same take that they've had for the last three months on the topic. But Barron is a player that, you know, with his size and part of the, you know, certainly can skate um, and has been an effective AHL player. The ability for him to kind of prove himself against NHL competition, I think, is um, something that will be interesting coming right out of the gate when the puck drops on Wednesday. Yeah, I mean, as much as it was surprising maybe to see him, you know, move up with some of the top-end scorers on the team, I mean, he's 6'4", 220 pounds, and what has Dave Lowry been preaching for this team really since he took over as head coach is to drive the net front for somebody to, you know, to 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 fight for those inner lanes to the net. I mean, you you saw it. 
um, with the LA Kings. That's that's essentially what they've done this season. That's allowed them to you know really speed up their their uh, their rebuild to the point where they're now fighting for you know top position in the Pacific Division. You know they fight for the puck, and so a guy like Morgan Barron. I mean, you can't teach size, as we know. Um, but you can kind of teach give a crap. And I mean, this is a guy that, that ultimately, you know, he has the size to do it. I think it's an interesting situation. It's, you know, reasons why you would see Adam Lowry on the power play now, different circumstance, obviously, but a big body in front of the net. And if you're generating, you know, he's he, Morgan Barron's also a guy that's not going to hog the puck. You know, if you put him on a line with like a Nick Ehlers or, you know, Kyle Connor or whomever guys who are, you know, sharp around the net, you know, he's going to cause cause havoc in front of the net. He's going to he's going to try to you know bust through those lanes, open lanes for players. So you know you and, and that's ultimately what I think we're headed to. I mean, Jansen Harkins, he's obviously you know there was an update on him today was he's in concussion protocol and has been ruled out for Wednesday, but is you know is you know I don't want to say likely but possible for for Friday's game. You know whether it's an injury to you know a forward or an injury to defenseman injury anywhere on the ice it leads to an opportunity for somebody else and I think Morgan Barron's an interesting you know an interesting guy I mean if you look at it I think he was drafted 174th that uh that uh 2017 draft and you have Christian Veselayan who was drafted 24th um in that same year and you have Morgan Barron you know carving out a role uh early you know early into his tenure here so uh you know I think there is opportunity for bigger guys to play harder games uh you know be hard on the puck I think that's probably one of the biggest you know inconsistencies for this team particularly up front is that you know driving to the net occupying those inner lanes and fighting for 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 the puck in those inner lanes so whether it's Morgan Barron or uh you know I guess you know I I guess they have, well, it, I don't, you know, maybe even gets an opportunity with, with Lowry and Appleton. I mean, Zach Sanford has that position for now. I mean, he's got more experience. So you want to have a guy, you know, who has more experience at this level, but maybe that's a possibility as a, you know, a potential tryout for him. We've seen guys on, you know, go through that line and, you know, whether it's Brandon Tana, Mason Appleton, who's back with the team, Andrew Kopp. I mean, the list is goes on and on about guys who have kind of used that position as a, as a stepping stone, perhaps Morgan Barron or somebody else you know, of his stature could, could, you know, carve out a role here with this team. No doubt about it. Well, Jets back on the ice tomorrow against the Detroit Red Wings, and uh, we'll certainly continue to uh, monitor this situation, but I think we know where it's going. Um, hey, before we go, and I have a feeling in the next, you know, few weeks, you know, through the, at the end of the regular season, many of our conversations will sort of shift from the Jets to the Winnipeg Blue Bombers. I mean, we're about a month and a half away from training camp getting going, which is exciting. Uh, but I did speak with somebody from the organization just casually over the weekend. And uh, I know they haven't been announcing anything, but there still is a ton of players to be signed before training camp for Kyle Walters. I mean, we focused in on many of the big guys, the star players that are mainstays of this team and the big guys from that crew. But um, I would imagine that at some point there will be an announcement of a long list of guys coming in to try to make the team in some ways somewhat similar to the way they packed the DB position last year with 30 guys to try to figure two that could come out and help them win another great cup. And by the way, they did quite a good job at that. Yeah. I mean, that's the process right now, right? Like they, they've just started to do some U S camps. So they, you know, they're, they're back to doing that this year where they, you know, guys have an opportunity. It's usually just a one day thing where they come out and they try to, you know, identify different guys, um, you know, those happen in the States, you know, near Florida where a lot of, you know, a lot of players are working out and, and, uh, you know, looking for opportunities. So that's pretty much it. I mean, the reality is, is that, you know, they certainly didn't sign a few notable names, you know, like Andrew Harris and, you know, Sergio Castillo and, you know, other kind of key, key positions. Uh, but they gave raises to a lot of others. And so it's left the Bombers in a situation where they're just going to have to, you know, lean on a good scouting team and, in uh, you know Ted and Danny over there, and 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 rely on them bringing in more first year rookie all star DBs, and and bringing in you know other guys that can uh, you know take the defensive lines and you know interior defensive lines another place. So you know replacing a guy like Stove Richardson, who I think is a you know maybe an under the radar loss, is a big a big one for the Bombers. So you know the good news is those are kind of the guys you can find. I mean that was evident over the last couple you know Grey Cup runs for the bombers is that you can find that including kicker i mean you can you can, if your defense is good enough you can figure out your kicking situation a month before great cup so i mean really you know this team's been able to be very you know quick on their feet 
Um, they certainly have a great, uh, you know, scouting staff and, and they also have, you know, who knows what other kind of signings could happen. I don't see a lot of like free agent signings, like, you know, necessarily experienced guys. I think those guys would already be added. I think there's, you know, at the point at, at, at right now, which is what, can you, can you believe it? Like six weeks, uh, maybe even a little bit less before, before camp gets underway. That's, that's exciting. So, um, you know, I think I, if I'm a bomber fan, I'm, I'm trusting in what you know what what the st- scouting staff is doing and expecting you know even better competition this year given you know the availability of those camps and and more opportunities to scout players. So uh, you know I still think even with even with the holes that the bombers need to fill, they they are favorites. I think they certainly are the team to beat, not just based on you know what they've been able to achieve the last couple of seasons, but just given who they've been able to re-sign. And we all know how continuity is important and. Um, you know, it should be an interesting year, but a, a successful one. And I'm looking forward to camp and seeing some of the new bodies. All right. And Hammer, that's awesome stuff. Uh, we, what do you got coming up in the free over the next few days? Jets, Jets, Jets. Uh, you know, I'm going to be riding this playoff push until it's extinguished. And then a little bit more after that, I imagine. And so, yeah, just kind of stay on, stay on track. Um, uh, I mean, I'm going to be in Ottawa and Montreal, so this weekend for the for the back-to-back games, which is going to be obviously really important. Hoping to be really important, assuming that they can, you know, you know, figure things out here over the next two games. So, uh, yeah, there's lots of Jets stuff on the horizon, and uh, yeah, going from there. Right on, Hammer. Thanks so much for doing this. Uh, great stuff. And by the way, shout out to the Free Press, Melissa Martin over in Poland. I know it's not really the sports stuff we're talking about, just some incredible, incredible reporting. You guys are doing some great work over there. Thanks, pal. We'll talk to you soon. Yeah, thanks so much for having me on. And uh, yeah, I really appreciate that shout out. We just, you know, it's important part. If you want to be an important newspaper, you got to invest in those things. And I'm, I'm really happy to be part of a, a newspaper and a media company that, that does care about that stuff. And again, as always, shout out to the commenters. You guys make this, you guys make it what it is. Talk to they're, you soon. Uh, they're enjoying you. Lots of hammer emotes in the, uh, in the chat today, Jeff. Uh, thanks for go. doing this. We'll talk to you soon. There's Jeff Hamilton of the Winnipeg Free Press. We are going to get to... Some more Masters talk coming up in just a second with Matt Light Wiley from the Golf Landia podcast. A uh, big shout out to our friends at Princess Auto. Now, of course, Princess Auto been amazing sponsors of Winnipeg Sports Talk all year and the curling scene in Manitoba and across Canada. And, uh, well, the curling season is sort of coming to an end, although Brad Gushu is still making a great run so far at the World Curling Championships. We'll touch on that over the next couple of days heading into the weekend for the finals. Uh, we've heard about all the off-season changes that are coming. That being said, all the teams that are just breaking up still playing at the Princess Auto Players Championship coming up in a couple of weeks. We'll look forward to covering that. And then transition over to uh, what Princesses Auto is doing in our community with both the Winnipeg Blue Bombers and the Winnipeg Gold Eyes. Cannot wait for that. Of course, Princess Auto is the place where you'll find the best deals on the most unique assortment of tools and equipment around. Everything you need to complete the projects on your list or start something new is at Princess Auto. Visit them at one of their two local locations or... You can shop online 24-7, 365 over at princessauto.com. Our great friends at Boston Pizza are ready for you before and after Eatery, Winnipeg, Jets, and Manitoba Moose game down at City Place. Or if you're just gathering with friends elsewhere in the city, no better place to watch the big game on the big screen with big sound than your local Boston pizza. Enjoy those gourmet pizzas, ice cold schooners, and famous Boston's wings. And if you're staying at home, check out their game day deals and you can order online at bostonpizza.com. Hey, Nick and Nikki continue to uh, be rolling into the summer. Blizzard season is back, although to be honest, it never really leaves. And of course, Nick and Nikki are so pumped for the incredible launch of the new Dairy Queen Stack Burgers. If you haven't tried one, Get on one today. Four locations here in Winnipeg and Southern Manitoba. To check them out at DQ in Niverville, DQ Northgate, DQ Polo Park, and DQ St. Anne's. And for those of you that, uh, like myself, enjoy quite a bit of delivery, uh, all three delivery apps can uh, get you the three Winnipeg stores from the Nick and Nikki DQ. A little bit later, we'll get to the Cool Bet Lines uh, we've got a late breaking line that we're adding in for the Blue Jays season, but we'll do that a little later on after some golf talk with Matt Wiley. Um, we do have, of course, our friends at Canadian Club so fired up that the CC and Ginger is now in stores. 
If you're picking up Canadian Club this month at your local Manitoba Liquor Mart, you get a free can of the CC and Ginger to try yourself. Um, and if you already know how great the taste of CC and Ginger is, you can pick up six packs and more at your local Manitoba Liquor Mart. And I'd imagine coming to uh, the bigger uh, beer stores with many single RTD products as well. Um, so pick that up, CC and Ginger, and of course, join us on Friday for the big marble race where we'll have another Canadian club and Winnipeg sports talk branded hoodie to give away to a lucky winner. So coming up is going to be some, uh, some masters talk. Remo, I saw Matt Wiley for a second and <laughs> yeah, it's exactly. Uh, I'll just send him right now that we are ready for him. Uh, that was our, uh, we are. Yeah, um, he, he came in and saw you and Jeff were just talking uh, bombers, and he's like, I think I'm in the wrong spot. Uh, yeah. He sent me a message, so um, we'll try to get him get him to click on the link again. Yeah, that was, uh, you know, sometimes we go all over the map on here. We were talking hockey, then we're talking mm -hmm. football, but of course we are talking Masters today, and uh, Remo, the big story, of course, Tiger Woods did his press conference today and uh, everybody fired up to see Eldrick in there on Thursday and hopefully wearing red on Sunday at Augusta National. Yeah, well, I wait for Matt um, to hop in here. I can play some of these Tiger clips. They're all ready to go. Uh, here's the, here, I'll give you the first one. Got to make sure it's all, all ready and all that stuff. But uh, yeah, says he's ready to go. Thinks he can win. Thinks he can hit the ball good. He's just worried about uh, what walking the course. That would be it's all we needed to hear. Let's hear what Tiger had to say this morning at Augusta. Somewhere around here, far right. Nope, they got you. Yep. When when yep. when will you decide um, whether for sure you're you're playing, and what will determine that? Well, as of right now, I feel like I am going to play. As of right now, um, I'm going to play nine more holes tomorrow. All right. Tiger's going to play nine more tomorrow, and we're going to talk about them all. And, of course, the big tournament coming up. Um, very, very pumped for this next conversation. Of course, we had Feinberg on last week. We'll continue to talk about it throughout the weekend, but I wanted to make sure that we didn't get through Masters Week without welcoming a proud Canadian south of the border and the uh, host of the Golf Landia podcast, Matt Wiley, for the first time with video on Winnipeg Sports Talk. Wiley, what's going on, man? Thanks for doing this. And uh, how are you, first and foremost? You ready for Thursday or what? So can I tell the story? <laughs> Please do. So I go into this link a little <laughs> early, and I land inside a Winnipeg Blue Bombers chat <laughs> as the fourth member, accidentally. And I'm just sitting there staring, listening to CFL content. <laughs> that's the way, that's the way yeah. we roll. We talked Jets for a long time. We were talking prospects because uh, we're not making the playoffs. And then we had Jeff Hamilton on. So we figured, hey, just quickly, what's going on with the Bombers? Yeah. Got to sign some players. Training camp coming up. But the main event this week, we certainly know, is Masters. So I, I won't be asking you to rate the Bombers linebacker or DB chart going into training camp, Matt. Yes. But I will ask you about... Uh, how fired up you are for the Masters and the effect, the Tiger effect on this tournament. I mean, it was still going to be the Masters, but it was pretty crazy that we were looking at maybe going into a field with no Tiger and no Phil. And I'll get your thoughts on the Phil situation a little later on. But Tiger yeah. being in, I mean, it just seems like it's pouring gas on a fire that was already burning pretty hard for golf and sports fans. Well, I mean, I, I watched his practice round yesterday, just him warming up, you know, doing – Shots around the green, chipping with a three iron down on a downhill lie. And he looked incredible. I mean, there's this, I mean, he always looks unbeatable, but there was this aura around him specifically yesterday. Firstly, he looks the size of the rock. He's gigantic. And everyone, it seemed out there, was a fanboy. I mean, the guys on tour. And every time that he'd even have a presence around these other golfers, they just looked smaller. They just looked, I mean, he, he certainly didn't look, and he didn't say in his interview that he was just there to test things out. Daniel Rappaport asked today, do you think you can win? Stone-faced, yes. And from what you're hearing about 
the shots he's making on the course. He's bombing it, according to Fred Couples. And his around the green game, of course, is still elite. I, I, I think it's one of the biggest, if you can have a biggest Tiger story ever, imagine he does well or wins. But the thing is with Tiger is that he's, he's like the solar eclipse. So he's sucking up all of the energy. And that may or may not help other players like a Rory who you know, doesn't like that spotlight as much because he puts so much pressure on himself to do better. So. It, it, it is, I mean, there, there's nothing like it anywhere else in sports. Tiger Woods' presence as opposed to his not being there and what it right. does to everyone else. And, right. I mean, it, it really, you're right. It affects, I think, I mean, there'll be some guys that, you know, are so far down, it doesn't really matter. They're maybe in awe of whoever they're playing with. Yeah. But, you know, if you're a, if you're Justin Thomas, if you're John Rahm, I mean, the guys at the top of the odds boards, they become a second thought. The second Eldrick rolls up to Augusta on Thursday. You cut the last part. I'm sorry, Andrew. I was, I'm just saying, I mean, they basically become a second thought to so many people covering the game yeah. and maybe in it when yeah. Tiger's around. And I mean, you're, you're, right. you worded it perfectly. The sucking up the oxygen. of So, I mean, that practice run yesterday, that mm-hmm. looked like the crowd for Sunday afternoon I, in the I've actual tournament. I've never seen anything like it. I've never seen anything like it. Um, and I, it, I think it will benefit a few players who are close who probably would benefit from a little less attention. Um, JT, perhaps, considering they're really good friends and they're very close. Uh, Rom in his interview today was interesting in that he didn't have the best anecdote about his relationship with Tiger in that Tiger has never given him any advice on anything. <laughs> he's asked for it, and he's just said, you know, basically, learn yourself. Whereas, you know, him and JT are like little brother and big brother. Uh, so you're right. Now, there is still distance between now and Thursday. He said the one thing that he has most difficulty with, not his game. He said, it's on point. I could win with this game. And I think that he would be honest and say, listen, I'm here. Don't have high expectations. But he's walking. I mean, this is a mountain. It's a, I mean, I know a lot of people know this and have been there, but the walk on this is the toughest walk in the PGA Tour. It's a gigantic campus. And everything is a hill. So that's the only question. Let me get let me ask you this. If you're uh, I mean, we were just looking over at Cool Bet and it opened up at even money to make the cut. That quickly went down to minus one oh five, minus 120 on to miss the cut. Um, is there value on a tiger playing the weekend bet? I think making the cut is a given. I said on Twitter, Tiger could top ten wearing a spacesuit. And I, <laughs> <laughs> I thought that was a pretty good one. Uh, no, I mean, I, I, I bet him to win. Uh, I only have three bets to win and a 50 to one tiger when he looks just incredible, um, and has that presence about him, that stare, that gait. Uh, he wasn't limping and, uh, his, he was putting on a master class around the green. 50 to one is insane. Well, uh, and I imagine those won't be out there very long, considering what we're hearing about Tiger as we get right. more steam heading into Thursday. Who are Absolutely. the other t- two guys that are on the card so far, uh, along with the three? Right. So, in so, people debate on Twitter about whether or not Augusta is a difficult course. You know, people say they could break eighty on it. Perhaps. I mean, what what makes Augusta difficult? Uh, the speed, if the wind gets up and it's dry. The putting and the breaks. Um, the, the biggest thing though, is the wrestling with the, the pressure and the ghosts and the fans and the crowd and the time that you have measured in your career to get a green jacket, like a Casey and a Rose. Uh, and now Rory's really on the clock too. Sergio was that's, that's the battle. So who are the people who mental, who mentally can accept that challenge, especially with the, you know, the orb that's Tiger floating around the entire course. Brooks is one. That's the one I had. Uh, I think he's very capable. Uh, and then Cam Smith, because he won a very difficult tournament in the players. Uh, and he's got a ton of guts. He is a guy that has tremendous creative shot ability. 
He grew up in the sand belt. He comps it to the sand belt. There's a lot of swirling wind here, and it's fast. And he's got just a lot of moxie. He's fearless. And you got to be here. You know, I, I listen, I, I, I love, love Cam Smith. His schedule has been a little weird, but I mean, again, he won the players after not playing very much, and we know what he's done at this tournament before. Two guys I want to ask you about that, you know, I think will be popular selections that I can make a pretty good argument that should be there on Sunday. Number one is Colin Morikawa, yeah. um, who already has two majors under his belt. And I'll tell you what, Matt, um. I said I was at the Ryder Cup and I said to my buddy that I was with after watching the job that Scotty Scheffler did, and I said, no matter what, I'm betting him at the Dell match play. And he came through and not only did he win that, he became the number one player in the world. The season that Scheffler has had has been incredible. He's only played there twice. He's got two top 20s so far. But when you're locked in and in a zone like that, I mean, um, I think Scotty Scheffler has the chance to win in any field anywhere right now the way he's playing. What do you think about Scheffler and Morikawa going into Thursday? Okay, let's start with Morikawa first. Uh, I saw his interview. I am not the biggest Morikawa fan yet. Uh, I think, and uh, this could be an unpopular opinion, I think, you know, during COVID when there were no fans, uh, the Open Championship when the conditions were just pristine, very non-open-like, again, no fans, um, he made a lot of hay taking nothing away from his game. I mean, he's an elite all-around ball striker, but this course is demanding from the short game side, right? I just don't see it with him as much uh, in, term in terms of having that elite skill set, those hands, same with Hovland, yet. Um, and just during his interview, he looked as though, I mean, he got some really tough questions, but he looked as though he was a little confounded as to why his game had not had good application at this course. He didn't look like in the frame of mind that I'd say that he's going to go out and dominate. I could be wrong. On who's the other guy? Scotty Scheffler. Scheffler. Now, Scheffler, I'm in Scheffler denial, right? Like, I, <laughs> like me, Xander Schauffele and, and Scotty Scheffler, anyone with a chef last name, I can't get behind, and I don't know why. But being top-priced, at least on DraftKings, or, or Fantasy Sports, excuse me, and now number one in the world. I think there's a heavy crown that he's bringing here that a lot of people are after. And I'm not sure that he, like I said, this is a course about pressure and succumbing and, and not succumbing to it. I just think there's too much for him to win. Do well, sure. Win. This could be a complete confirmation bias of my own, but I'm going to say no. Uh, Matt, what about, I mean, there's nothing more fun than hitting a couple bombs when you go yeah. into a tournament like that. When you're uh, looking at the outrights of some players further down that you think just might be a good value bet that you think might have the game to at least be there on Sunday and have a chance to win, is there a, a guy or two that's further down the odds board that uh, you're giving strong consideration to uh, an investment? Yeah, there's a few. Uh, Mike Weir. Sorry. <laughs> Hey, four the for cheap four Canadian for cuts this year. Huh? Yeah, he might make the odd uh, DraftKings lineup. I was looking. Oh, I got another Canadian. I can say. Never mind. I'll, I'll say another Canadian. That one. I, I, I'm cheap. Applause. W H O R E. The um, I like Leishman a lot. Uh, I think he's one of the better iron players in the world, and he tailors his game for the Masters. Um, he wants one. Everyone wants one. He certainly does. Gary Woodland. Another great guy, won a U.S. Open, great around the green. Um, Corey Connors, I can't say enough about Corey Connors, the way he played in Dell match play. He's just, he's got this even rhythm to him. He doesn't get phased. He doesn't, you need that. He doesn't change personalities. He doesn't get beat up over a bad hole like a Dustin Johnson. He's got, I, and he plays well here. I mean, he was leader a couple of years ago. Corey, uh, Corey Connor has elite game. I don't know if he, he showed a lot of short game too at the Dell match play too, which I was impressed with. Um, He's back to back top tens at this tournament. Actually, we were just looking at that. I mean, back to back right. top tens at Augusta. It's not like he hasn't been in the mix on Sundays. No. And one was during the uh, November run, which is a totally different course. So he had to asterisk that, but then he came back and ran it again. And I mean, he's, this is a ball strikers paradise every week is, but this is the Mecca. This is the epicenter of it. This is the all American test for ball striking. And 
you know, he's one of the best on earth to do it. It's just about the recovery. If he misses a green, can he perform like the others do? And I think he's shown something. Uh, I would not leave Connors out for sure. And then the other one's Paul Casey, okay? That's the chalk darling every year. The problem with Paul Casey is that he had that, was it the back injury? Yeah, it was a back injury last week, and he withdrew. No, the Dell, he withdrew. He lost all three matches, and so everyone's a little spooked. But now Paul Casey is like 80 to 1 on some markets. For, who was second at the players. I mean, this is Paul Casey, who has led in the, ma- in the Masters many times, several times. Um, those are the ones I'd look at. Oh, man, this is great stuff. Matt Wiley is with us. He is the host and creator of the Golf Landia podcast. Check it out, and you can follow him on Twitter at Wiley77. Uh, before we go, I know you spent a lot of time cranking out DraftKings lineups. Yep. Finally, shout out to DraftKings for finally figuring it out and being able to expand resizable contests beyond 20. That was a big, big bonus for us, although we knew the Masters would fill quickly. A lot of people here right now, they know the big guys. Give me a couple low-dollar ballers, Wiley, that you know you can use at the bottom of the group to supplement the big boys that you think might make the cut and help you win a little scratch. Um, there's nothing really down low because, look, if you're building lineups, this isn't a regular PGA week where you just find six to make the cut. You've got to find six near the top. I mean, the, there's a 90 per- 91 person field. Uh, a good portion of it has no shot. And, and then so you've got to find winners. The only one I would go as low as at this point, well, there may be two. Stu Sink at 64, possibly. If you want the older guy narrative, he plays well. He's a veteran. you got to be an experienced player, iron player, know the shots, know your way around this course. And then the big beauty is Tom, Thomas Peters, right? At 6,700. I, I'm, in, I'm in love with everything about Thomas Peters. His game, his iron play, his, de- his, his demeanor, he's fierce, he's a, he's a bomber, he can putt. He's got one of the most beautiful swings in the world. And he's done well here at one point. Um, but a lot of people are playing Peters, so that's potentially a, a chalk miss too. That <laughs> could be great. Um, listen, we cannot wait to get going. Um, to fill people in on what you got going on over at Golflandia for folks that uh, haven't checked out the pod. And uh, Masters week must be one of the biggest weeks for the pod all year long, I'd imagine. Uh, yeah, it is. I mean, if you want to follow what I'm doing, it's on Twitter at Wiley77, and the podcast is on spot. It's on everywhere on the internet. It's called Golflandia. Uh, and thank you for calling it Golflandia. Your Toronto counterparts called it Galando one time, and I just let them have <laughs> Those it. Those bozos. <laughs> it's Mike Wilcox from the Galando podcast. Um, <laughs> they literally said that. Um, uh, but that's where you find it. And, yes, yeah, I have Ray Flo- So Ray Floyd, if you have a second, Ray Floyd is a uh, junior, is a good friend of my, mine. Obviously, his dad won the Masters. And he does the best scouting of the course every week. And he's going to come on live on my Twitter account on Wednesday. And we're going to, he's playing the par three, sorry, he's caddying the par three contest. And he's going to give all the insight he's got. Uh, he kind of looks at players like you do horses in the paddock. And he gives a lot of good insight. And Zach Caleros is my favorite quarterback on the Winnipeg Blue Bombers. Thank you. Yes, Cincinnati Bearcat, back to back Grey Cup champ. Hey, you should look Absolutely. at your those future markets. Cubanville, Ohio. <laughs> We're back in the motherland. Uh, because uh, maybe for the first time since those glory days Edmonton teams of the 80s, we could have a three-peat in the Canadian you know Football League right here in you Winnipeg. Screw, screw the Eskimos. Yeah, honestly. well, exactly. They're out. And they're now actually the Elks, too. They got, uh, much like the Cleveland screw Guardians, the, the, the Commanders, and now... The Elks. Wiley, thanks so much for doing this. I love the work that you do. Uh, Have a great Masters. Good luck to everything that you get on. And uh, let's do this again later on this summer. All right, mate. Thanks. Appreciate it. At Wiley77, folks, there's Matthew Wiley from Golflandia with us on Winnipeg Sports Talk Daily. Hey, speaking of golf, all of our golf reports are brought to you by our friends at Breezy Bend Golf and Country Club. Um, (laughs) What can I tell you? I'm so excited for golf season. I wasn't able to play last year, but I will be making a return to the links. Um, and as much as I'm excited to get onto the golf course to see the incredible work that they've done on the golf course, along with Craig McLeod, for my money, the uh, 
the biggest free agent signing in sports in the last number of years in Winnipeg with what he's done to that golf course as the superintendent. The 19th hole, pretty damn good too. Best patio in the city to uh, overlook it. Uh, if you're thinking about a home for your family and golf, very full for this year, but you know, get on that waiting list, talk to them about opportunities that are coming forward. And uh, certainly if you are looking for a great spot to host a wedding or an event, the gang at Breezy Bend is a top drawer job each and every time. BreezyBend.ca for more on our friends at Breezy Bend Country Club. And we'll have lots of Breezy Bend golf reports coming up beginning tomorrow and Thursday uh, with some more Masters analysis. And then the latest from the course on Thursday and Friday. Hey, not Autocorp. Uh, I posted on my Instagram yesterday a great video that the uh, Winnipeg Car Lab did talking about some of the wraps that they do, what influences cost, what you need to be thinking about when you're looking to do those. They're also working on another one for the Tesla experience, which I've told you about. If you have any interest in moving to an electric vehicle, but want to find out more about it, want to test drive the Teslas, want to find out more about charging it, what you can and cannot do, the experts at Not have been the leaders in Teslas for almost 10 years here in Winnipeg and always have a number of Teslas on the lot. Pop down, talk to Trevor and his amazing team about that. And regardless of whether you're thinking electric or traditional vehicles, why not get into the car of your dreams at a great price with the help of the Knot team, Waverly and McGilvery, and online at Knot.ca. Hey, a big cheers to our friends at Little Brown Jug. Spring is here. We're going to be outside again. You should give them a follow on their Instagram page over at Little Brown Jug. Uh, because they've got some great, great events. I mean, they've been doing outdoor movies, uh, campfire treats outside with a few cold beers, and certainly some great community events as well. Not to mention all the information on the amazing beers that you can get down at William Avenue, including the iconic 1919, which is also a go-to at many fine bars and restaurants around. Uh, it did a hilarious video yesterday getting ready for the new summer variety pack, which is being cranked. The good times variety pack, I should call it right now. Um, so you can get all that down at William Avenue. And by the way, for everyone that's with us right now, I think I plugged this right at the beginning of the program. I know people are in and out at different times. We, along with Little Brown Jug, also nominated in the Winnipeg Nightlife and Lifestyle Awards. Um, so if you would be so kind, pop on over to WNLA.ca. Uh, give Winnipeg Sports Talk a vote in the top radio station slash podcast category. And uh, when you get to your favorite local beer, I think you know what our favorite local beer, that, of course, is Little Brown Jug. You know, Nicolino's is on that list. Some other great, great um, uh, local uh, businesses um, and people. And as I said, right there, I don't know why it happened. At the start, we were the first option. Now we're the last option. But again, you know what Winnipeg Sports Talk is. Do us a favor. Give us a vote. Tell a friend that would really help us out. And uh, let's hopefully see our friends Little Brown Jug take an award there as well. It's all online at WNLA.ca. Vote Winnipeg Sports Talk today. All right, we do have to get to the uh, cool bet lines and uh, more. But let's get Michael Remus back here. And Remo, speaking of the Masters... I know there's been a lot of excitement and a lot of talk about this tournament in the chat. We had a great conversation yesterday, had another one today with Matt Wiley. And uh, man, it didn't take long for that DraftKings uh, contest that we put up with 50 people to fill up. I mean, this one is just kind of beyond everything else we do all year with how excited people are to get a squad. Ah, shit, sorry. I was, but I was going to say, if you're a casual golf fan, you know about the Masters. Um, you know, you see everyone doing gambling now uh, with the Ontario, uh, you know, becoming. So you see all the promotions. And I think if you're, like, if you're a fan, you know the history of the course, you know the players, you want to get in on a little excitement. And I think it just, it doesn't, I don't, look, all I needed for me personally is like, a, you know, a dollar, three dollars, throw in a lineup, uh, have a little fun. So, um, so I guess people are excited. And yeah, Tiger Woods, I think, pulls up the interest. It is going to be a very busy um, Thursday with the Thursday Masters and opening day in baseball. Shout out to Manny Fran, who's going to have his uh, TV flipping back and forth. 
Well, no doubt about that. And I'll tell you what, while we're at it, let's go get the cool bet lines. And the first thing I want to get to is the Major League Baseball futures because we were doing a lock shop show today and we were talking about this Jays number at 92 and a half. We then started talking about the Jays to potentially win 100 games. And you know, we thought, you know, why don't we lean on our pal Chris Abbott to try to uh, put up a number for that? So the Jays for over 92 and a half was minus 130. We have now, and this has just happened in the last hour. If you go to the season wins, um, Sarima, go down to the bottom, you'll get into futures, and then you go to season wins. And if you go down to the Blue Jays number, you have the option of going from the 92 number which is minus 130 over 92 and a half to the aggressive number of 99 and a half. But if you do think the Jays have a hundred win season in them in you, uh, we've got it up to plus 200. Now he did say as this get bet gets bet, it will probably come down. So there you are first crack at the two to one number on the Jays to go over 99 and a half. That's available at cool bet right now. They've also got world series numbers. And the Jays are the number two team on that list. Dodgers at five to one, and then the Blue Jays at eight to one. So much excitement for Blue Jays season. And uh, we'll be talking about that coming up in the next couple of days as well. Um, as far as the National Hockey League goes, we got a busy, busy game tonight. Um, very, very busy, busy game, busy night of games, excuse me. Um, Carolina minus 263 at Buffalo Panthers minus 179 taken off the Leafs after their very impressive win last night against the Tampa Bay Lightning but Leafs playing on the second end of back-to-backs um, we've got Ottawa slight favorite in Montreal Rangers road favorites in New Jersey at minus 152 Columbus played last night their 120 plus 122 road dogs against the Flyers Great matchup, straight up pick them between the Avalanche and the Penguins tonight. Uh, Bruins, no surprise, minus 208 favorites on the road. Game I'm interested in, pick this one in the lock shop. The Wild have what won 9 of 10. They are rolling right now. But a big part of that has been Cam Talbot. Marc-Andre Fleury is getting the start tonight for the Wild. They're still a slight favorite in Nashville to take on the Nashville Predators. And I do like the Islanders to beat the Dallas Stars. Islanders have won six of eight. Dallas in the first game back after their road trip where they were essentially going through the JV division of the NHL. Uh, Islanders was plus 19, come down a little bit, but plus 14 on that. Other games tonight uh, include the Edmonton Oilers, minus 182 at the San Jose Sharks. And I know Dusty was on Oilers over three and a half as they've been uh, been um, been rolling lately. And of course, you can get to all of that content and master's picks at today's lock shop. Um, tomorrow at 11 a.m., I'll be doing a live show. I'll tweet this out over with the Cool Bet guys, kind of beyond just the outrights, looking to make the cut uh, props, as well as top fives, top tens, top 20s. Uh, but right now, the Masters is all there for you. Um, we've got the group winners as well. We've got tournament head-to-heads. And all of the outrights, beginning with John Rom as the favorite right now at 12 to 1, Justin Thomas 14 to 1, Scheffler and Cam Smith at 17, DJ at 19. Those are your top five favorites, but it's all there for you at Cool Bet. And again, if you've never played at CoolBet.com before, use the promo code WST for a 100% bonus on your first deposit up to 200 bucks and good luck. Uh, back to the grind tomorrow, Remo, with a game day edition of the show. Yeah, game day edition. Uh, ranch Tuesday is asking Chet, what are the odds of Tiger to make the cut? Okay, so plus Tigers 100? make the cut. It was plus 100 when it, uh, when it came out. Oh, and it's back to plus 100. Yeah. Interesting. We may yes. have to hit that a little harder uh, because it was minus 105 a little earlier today, and I really thought it was going to go back the other way. So, uh, yeah, if you want to get on Tiger to make the cut, I would suggest now is the time to do it. I expect that number, to be honest, to be closer to a pick em. Uh, But right now, to make the cut plus 100, to miss the cut minus 128, and uh, I don't know, I, I would never in a million years bet against Tiger Woods to make the cut, even in the current predicament. So with... Uh, with a plus 100 hung out there, there might be a little bit larger of a touch on Tiger to uh, play the weekend. Mm. 
Yeah, before we go, I got some NHL notes here, Huss, that uh, we got to get okay. to. Okay, you know what? Let's let's do that. One other thing. I can't remember sure. who it was in chat that was asking about Phil Mickelson. I know we were going to talk about that. We hit that yesterday. Uh, no Phil. Phil is persona non grata right now on the PGA Tour from what we can tell. And much like when DJ had the uh, the drug issues where he just took some time off for personal leave, they don't announce suspensions. Um, but it is believed that Phil has been sort of told that he's not welcome. Now, the Masters is a different story, and he announced that he's not playing. They haven't talked at all about it, so your guess is as good as mine when we'll see Phil Mickelson back on tour or playing in big events, even on the senior tour, um, just because of the fallout of um, the fiasco of what he had to say about the Saudis, the Saudi Golf League, the PGA Tour, um, that cost him some of the most lucrative endorsement contracts in all of golf. So uh, no Phil, we will have Tiger. And uh, Remo, as I mentioned last year, can you imagine after Phil became the oldest player ever to win a major winning the PGA, that we'd fast forward less than 12 months ahead, Tiger after the car accident would be playing, and Phil would basically be a pariah of the game? Still absolutely stunning. Yeah, Phil was, you know, he became such a likable funny guy on social media and kind of threw that all the way with those comments earlier, you know, being dropped by all of his uh, sponsors. So yeah, no Phil, but we will have Tiger. So everyone is, uh, is fired up for that. No doubt. Okay. Let's get to these, uh, these news okay. and notes in the national hockey league. I, couldn't we, st we should start with Ryan gets. Yeah, that was the number one. Ryan gets announcing after this season, he's going to retire, played his entire 17 career uh, with you know, with one team, the Anaheim Ducks. I thought, you know, maybe you'd see him at the end sign with someone else for men's salary and try to chase a Stanley Cup. He did win one with 2007 with Anaheim. 1,150 games, 1,013 points. He played on Team Canada at the Olympics. Uh, you know, him and, what, him and, he's the last remaining player from the Ducks, uh, you know, Stanley Cup team, of course. I mean, he's still a productive player. And not where he was. What did he have? Career high, uh, 91 points in 08 09. Strong, big two way center. He's sort of turned into Joe Thornton now. Yeah. I mean, if you look at if you look at his numbers, doesn't skate quite like he did before. But I mean, he's certainly still a big guy, can hold his own, um, and knows the game as well as anyone. But it is somewhat startling to see him with a three goals on the season, but with 28 assists, I mean, far more productive, almost two to one than he was productive last year with the Ducks, uh, but it pretty much all is an assist. And I'll say this, I think the Ducks probably benefited big time from having Getzlaff there this year with some of the young players like Trevor Zegras. And, mm -hmm. you know, when you have a, a legendary player for your franchise like that, that's done so much, that's been there for so long, um, there definitely is a lot to get out of having his presence with he's, that club with young players like Zegers. You know, it seems like he's been around a long time here, 17 career. You think he's going to be like in his 40s, but he's only 36, um, turning 37 in May. Like he could probably hang around a couple more, a couple more years, but hey, I mean, you don't see this too often anymore. One guy playing his entire career for 17 years, one team, uh, incredible career. I don't know if we've started the the Hall of Fame uh, debates yet with Ryan with Ryan gets left, but uh, you know he's definitely a top player in the league uh, for a number. Of years. You know what's wild? He only had one thirty goal season in yeah. the National Hockey League. He scored thirty one in twenty thirteen fourteen, and that was his second best season, eighty seven points. He had twenty five and ninety one points in oh eight oh nine. Um, a couple of years after they won that Stanley Cup, and that was when Anaheim was a really, I mean, a real wrecking crew, um, you know, with Perry and Getzlaff. And I do remember, actually, you know, being with Gary, we were on the road down. This would have been year one or year two, whenever it happened, and the announcement that, you know, he and Perry were getting inked to those eight-year extensions. Um, listen, they certainly earned them. Um, later on, Perry got bought out. Getzlaff managed to stay till the end. And, um, you know, we'll see about Hall of Fame discussions. He definitely will be going into that Ducks Hall of Fame and getting the uh, the number retired. Yeah. And it is cool in in today's day and age with the amount of player movement we see to see a guy that you know plays more than a thousand games, eleven fifty, his entire career gets to the peak of the game, 
and retires with that same team that he started. Doesn't happen very often, but uh, it did in Anaheim. And of course, a big part of that is winning a cup earlier in your career. Yeah, winning a cup, won gold medals uh, with Canada, and estimated career earnings on cap friendly for the sub ninety four million, which seems really high for Ooh. an NHL. Mm. But he had a uh, that sixty six million dollar eight year contract that's expiring after this season. He had a twenty six million. So you know, you do the quick math, it gets up there. So and, you know, you talk about players who've played their entire, you know, lengthy career with one team. Uh, him and uh, Patrice Bergeron is the other one right now with Boston, also a Stanley Cup champion, captain, center. And you have to wonder uh what he's gonna do after this season in the UFA and how weird it would be if he was on another team. So again, you don't see that too often, but um Pretty cool. I thought maybe he would sign with with someone, but uh, opting to hang it up. I guess like, hey, you. you, you I nice thought amount. I thought he might get dealt. Yes. I mean, they traded everybody else. I mean, you can not telling me a team like Edmonton or one of these teams that you know hasn't had a lot of playoff success or anything like that couldn't use to have a guy like Getzlaff in the room and playing in the bottom six. Uh, but listen, I think it was important to him. He's already won a Stanley Cup. I mean, it's pretty clear came back for another year to be a duck. And, you know, as much as the team and the facility isn't maybe what some of the other teams are in the National Hockey League, um, the guys that are playing down there certainly love it. It is an incredible place to live. The weather's great. And um, something tells me that Ryan Getzlaff's not going to have to move once he's done now that he's retired. He's already in uh, where the place he'll probably be for the rest of his life. Interesting to see if he gets involved in the organization. Yeah, I think maybe he would want to take some time off, hang out by the beach for a bit before you. I think that's what people people do. You need some time to yourself, or maybe you just want to jump. You got an opportunity and you want to jump, uh, jump right in. Um, one other note from last night has um, not Austin Matthews, who scored, uh, who tied the Leafs re- franchise record for goals in a season. But did you see this with Wayne Simmons and Pat Maroon? They were yelling at each other on the benches. Yeah, well, this is Simmons' deal now. This is all he does. He just beaks off at the guy from the other team on the benches. The same thing happened with Adam Lowry on uh, Thursday night. Ten, ten minute misconduct for chirping on the bench. Uh, <laughs> Pat Maroon. Pat Maroon thinks that this is part of the, uh, what did you call it yesterday? The wussification of hockey? Yeah, well, I was using quotes because I don't yeah. really believe in the wussification you, of hockey. You didn't, but... he, he didn't say that, but here, here's the clip from Pat, Pat Maroon. This game's going the wrong way. I don't know. I just, if, I guess you can't chirp each other on the bench now. I guess that's illegal. I guess it's better to watch 1980s hockey when guys are chirping each other, but I don't know why they did that, but the game's going the opposite way, I guess. They don't want to see that anymore. I guess he said it's bad for the TV, which is really shocking to me, but. <laughs> I don't necessarily disagree with him at all on that, but for uh, Maroon to be saying, oh, hockey's in a bad place and going in such a bad direction when he's won three consecutive Stanley Cups is sort of an interesting take, but I realized it had nothing to do with that. It was the fact that he had to sit his ass in the penalty box for uh, 10 minutes, as did Wayne Simmons. Um, and that I, I can't remember another situation where, you know, guys basically got, you know, coincidental 10 10 10s one guy from each bench. And just to go back to the thing, I mean, Lowry and Wayne Simmons were going back and forth. And I actually did hear, I, sh- I meant, meant to mention this before, I was listening to Ray Ferraro the following day, hmm. I think on Overdrive or something like that. And Ray, of course, was in between the benches. And, you know, Lowry's yelling at Wayne Simmons like he can't get on the ice. And <laughs> Wayne Simmons, according to Ray, had a, a series of material based on the fact that his dad was the coach of the Winnipeg <laughs> Jets. Well, um, and, and I'm like, no kidding. That must that is the most low lying fruit when it comes to hockey trash talk ever. And you know, uh, Hamilton was mentioning that it is sort of a weird situation that Dave Lowry came into. His first opportunity happens to be on a spot on a team with his son as the as you know a top player. But I'll say this at the same time, and I know Adam Lowry's a big boy and he can handle himself, and it's not a big deal. But it is got to be a very weird situation for Adam as well on this. And uh, let's just say I wasn't at all surprised that trash talkers in the NHL were jumping on the fact that uh, 
Jungle Dave is the uh, coach of Adam Lowry. And, uh, well, that's what Ray had for us last week post-Jets Leafs on Thursday. Yeah, Joe Smith of the Tampa Bay Times said, Brian Engblom, who was between the benches, said the line that Maroon told Wayne Simmons was, hey, you're going to be out of the league next year anyway. And uh, the ref told Maroon that the chirping was bad for I think the chirping is great for TV. That's how you get likes. I see two players going at it. I mean, we see this in the NFL where they give these dumb flags for taunting. I think that's the dumbest. That's the dumbest thing ever. So that's a big. We don't do this, but big thumbs down for that ref. This is why the refs yeah. need to come out and give uh, give their post game press conference and tell us why they called that, so we can rip on them more or no. Well, I, I say no on that. It's hard I'm enough say, to get. Yeah, it's hard enough to get these refs and the I, shit that they go through to get to the National Hockey League and all the idiots. No, that, I agree. You know, when it comes to what these young, you know, men and women deal with at the minor hockey level and to go through, I mean, there's a reason why it's tough to find good refs. No one wants to ref (laughs) because you get treated like garbage. That being said, hey, you're in the National Hockey League making pretty good money. Um, They know how to deal with it. But it was strange to see those two guys thrown off at the same time. Hey, you mentioned Austin Matthews. Mm -hmm. Credit where credit is due. Another hat trick last night. Austin Matthews has 47 goals in his last 47 game. Um, I know there's a lot of arguments for other great players in the league, but uh, I'll be honest. I think if I had a vote, I think Austin Matthews is my heart trophy guy. You know, I said, um, funny, I said yesterday on the show, McDavid was my pick, but uh, might have tipped the scales there with that hat trick. I saw that, also saw he's on pace for 69 goals, a really nice number. So. Uh, again, that's heartworthy, heart trophy consideration. Um, you know, he's not just getting it done, scoring goals. Very strong two way player. He's big, uses his body, you know, retrieves pucks. You know, you don't hear a lot for Mitch Mar- a lot of talk from Mitch Marner, but I mean, you're seeing goal scoring this year that we haven't seen in years. And yeah, Austin Matthews, 54 goals, 38 assists, 92 points. Todd for Tanny Maybe. and chat. No chirping. Too much skilled plays without a punch in the mouth. What's next? What's next in hockey? Yeah. <laughs> nice so, one, Todd. Pretty, um, yeah, pretty incredible numbers. And as far as, you know, the points, yeah, McDavid is leading the league in points, 105. And then Mc, uh, Matthew's down there, 92. So, I, man, I, Marner's down there. I don't know. Maybe you do go Matthews for hard. I could flip-flop every day. Thankfully, I don't have to vote. But there are, like, Three to five pretty strong arguments you can make. Yeah, for no, de- definitely. I just think right now, if you put a gun to my head, I'm voting Austin Matthews, and I know that'll probably trigger a lot of people in the chat, but I'm trying not to discriminate against him because he plays for the Toronto Maple Leafs. He has just been that damn good. And the one thing that Matthews has that McDavid doesn't have, that Marner doesn't have, that that dry sidle to an extent, but not close, Austin Matthews is a, is a very good defensive player. I mean, Austin Matthews is, um, listen, he's a guy that I don't think any coach would ever be worried about putting out, um, you know, if he's spending a lot of time in his own end because um, he's just at a different level than many of the other most prolific offensive players in the league. Uh, that being said, we don't have to vote right now in the Hart Trophy. There's still a month left in the season. 12 more games for the Winnipeg Jets. And one of those games is the Connor Hellebuck fishing bobblehead night tomorrow. I am looking forward to that bobblehead night. I won't lie about that. I'm definitely going to be at the game to pick that one up. Um, But other than that, we got one more day. We'll probably watch a little live from the Masters tonight. Check up on more of the player interviews. Figure out a few more picks for uh, tomorrow's show, as well as the Cool Bet special tomorrow at 11 o'clock. Just follow my Twitter. I'll tweet out a link of when we go live, or you can just go to Cool Bet on YouTube. A cool bit Canada on YouTube. Subscribe, put your notifications on, and I'll be live with the guys tomorrow at eleven o'clock. And then uh, tomorrow, Reem, we are going to be uh, we're going to be busy. Chris Meany's coming on with us tomorrow. Murata Tesh to get ready for the game, and I'll certainly do my best to get one more Masters guest to uh, get their thoughts on the big tourney before tee off on Thursday from Augusta. Yeah, looking forward to, it. and we do have. Um opening day coming up Thursday as well. TV's getting a workout. I got my tablet going. Um, hey, one thing we didn't mention also to uh, the NCAA went down to the wire yesterday in the March Madness. With Biggest Can- comeback ever. With Kansas winning. It looked like Slobo was going to take down our 
our pool. He sent me a DM, said someone messaged him and said, hey, you heard, but uh, let me just remind, refresh myself who the winner was of our, gra- our bracket. Yeah, Slobo needed Carolina to yeah. stay on top, and whoever was in second had KU. It was Richard B. Richard, Richard B. Well done. Hit us up, Winnipeg Sports Talk at gmail.com. We'll uh, hook you up with the prize for your incredible performance in the contest. And yeah, as we can see, I mean, winning, getting the champion right was so huge. I mean, the top five finishers all had Kansas and uh, made up big, big ground with getting the tournament winner right. I should give a shout out to Dusty, too. He uh, had Kansas at 12 to 1, gave it out as his pre tournament pick on the lock shop. A lot of people were fired up getting a few tweets on that last night. Yeah, check out today's lock shop. A lot of good stuff today. I wore my green jacket for making Masters picks. May have to bring the green jacket out tomorrow afternoon or for Thursday here on the program. So uh, we'll look forward to doing that. What uh, what are you watching tonight? I got, uh, I'm watching my fantasy baseball draft. I got, I got two more tonight. I had one yesterday, an auction. Started at 7.30. PM. I think I was done around midnight, but I don't think it ended until after twelve thirty. You just spent your money and said, "Okay, I'm out of here, guys." Well, I had yeah, I had got all my players, and I was happy I did because the players who were going after I was done were not Thanks. not quality talent. Who so, uh, who'd you spend your money on? Give us a very quick thirty second I'll synopsis of uh, of uh, who you who you drop. What was the what was the auction total? Like what? How much you money did you just start with? Two sixty sixty dollars, and then there were twelve teams. I'll give you. My- uh, Freddie Freeman, I think, was my top player. Now on the Dodgers, I'm a big fan. People make fun of me in the league because I just take the same players I have <laughs> every year. <laughs> I'm, I'm the same way. I, I get the I get the same guys. Uh, let me see my my team. I have Freddie Freeman. He was forty. Luis Robert on Chicago. I had there for thirty two. I think that was it. Lindor twenty three. Cedric Mullins twenty one. Yeah, so I, I'm usually more balanced. I don't spend a lot. I missed out early on some guys. So I, Who were like missed. the top couple, like most expensive okay. guys? And Vlad, what, was, what was the ticket? Vlad Guerrero Jr. went for an obscene $62. Like no one went, and Otani went for an even more ridiculous 71 I don't think, I don't think people should be going in the $60. So, um, you know, Otani, you could play him as a pitcher and a hitter. Not at the same time. You have to pick one for each day. So I guess he would be pretty valuable for that. So I wouldn't do that, but that was other people. I would have maybe done that. I found that being cheap and just trying to get a bunch of mediocre players gives you just sort of a mediocre team. The, I think the, the boom and the bust. Like if you want to win, sometimes you got to be aggressive. Certainly I do that a little bit more now in fantasy football, learning the hard way, but uh Anyways, all I know is that from all the guys that you just mentioned, I got to brush up on a lot of baseball stuff before the season gets uh, going. Coming up on Thursday. Yeah, this was my brushing up. I usually usually it would spend like a month or a couple of weeks like reading magazine stuff. I did not do that, but I know remember all the guys from last year. So it kind of came back to me. But yeah, I got to, I got to draft tonight seven. I'm sure it's gonna go like seven to nine thirty. Then I got another one at nine thirty. Two. I'm assuming it's two up. These are just. Sick I just want to get I want to get in these in these pools in these fantasy leagues mm-hmm. with guys like you that used to be hardo fantasy nerds but now you're married with kids you don't have that same ability to no. GM the way you did before and that that I think is the sweet spot to come in so um well, let I, me know if uh, you know someone has their third kid and says oh I can't be in the mix I'll just roll in the single guy and I'll have a Huge advantage over the rest of the league for preparatory time and ability to spend time on lineup. You know, you just get, um, it's so much better now. You can just get like a download a spreadsheet online that has projections. So I kind of just go off that. And But um, yeah, I mean, all my drafts used to be like, okay, Saturday afternoon, it's going to be so much fun, you know, sit on the patio, do a draft. Now everyone's like busy with their, their kids Saturdays. <laughs> now, Saturday afternoon is like big, big weekend time for me. I can't yeah. just. Wife, Monday night at dry. 11 guys uh yeah. just uh rotate your player or uh, rank your players if you can't make it and we'll do it no way to do a yeah. draft anyways we got to get this pod up fun fun show today thanks to wiley for popping by and uh, great stuff if you joined in late uh, we had a great conversation about um scouting this season upcoming draft as well as the jets top prospects with scott wheeler of the athletic and uh, always great to have Jeff Hamilton come in. We hit quite a bit of Jets and even a bit of Bomber stuff at the end. 
Tomorrow on the program, Murata Tesh, my guy Chris Meany from Mean Streets on Fantasy Network. Uh, cannot wait for that. We will do a little bit more on the Masters as the uh, tournament gets going on Thursday morning. And, of course, Jets and Red Wings tomorrow for the big Connor Hellebuck fishing bobblehead night. Um, big thanks to all of our sponsors, Wallace and Wallace and Breezy Ben. Great to have you back on board with us. Wallace and Wallace on board for the first time. Uh, F Apparel, Vita Health, Culligan Water, Royal Sports, Manitoba Battery, Not Auto Corp, Little Brown Jug, don't forget WNLA.ca. Give us a vote for uh, that Winnipeg Nightlife Awards in the radio station podcast category. And uh, certainly pop one in for Little Brown Jug. Princess Auto, Boston Pizza, the Nick and Nicky DQ Group, Canadian Club, and Cool Bet Canada. Folks, have a great night. Lots of hockey to watch. And golf. The Masters just around the corner, about uh, well, 36 hours away or so. We will see you tomorrow, 1 p.m. live on YouTube, getting ready for Jets Wings here on Winnipeg Sports Talk Daily. Thanks for joining us. Oh, my God. Oh! Shut it down. Let's go home. Thanks for tuning in to Winnipeg Sports Talk Daily. Make sure to subscribe on YouTube and your favorite podcast feed at winnipegsportstalk.com.